Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours. Thank you for joining us today. As always, also, thanks for programming the show with your questions. Remember that you can use the QR code that pops up during the show at various times. If you want to get more involved, you can use Mukana. Not only add questions, but vote on those questions, because questions are the way we program the show. The more votes is what we get to first and spend the most time on. Today, in our second hour, um, we're going to be talking about the Academy Awards, particularly graphics and things like that. But uh, anything you want to chat about in terms of the uh, Academy Awards, how it was presented. Right now, though, it's question time. So let's start it. Courtney, what have we got for our first question? Our first question comes in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida, and he asks, do you travel with a power bank? And if so, what do you use? One of the most fundamental questions, and I'm going through that right now in terms of what I'm going to take with me to NAB. So, Jeffrey Powers, start us off. Uh, depending on the travel, uh, of course, uh, the, I, I try and do a lot of Ian Bag, uh, at least four or five different uh, power banks. I used a company called Trusted Source, I think it was. I don't think they exist anymore. Uh, but the cool thing about them is this: these were tough uh, case power banks that actually had a carabiner attached to it so I could attach it to my uh, tripod or uh, to my bag if I needed to. And I always tried to go three or four uh, at about 10,000 milliamps because the you got to go 100 watts, which is about 93 kilowatts uh, for the plane. You can't take anything higher than that onto the plane. So, But uh, with that, I can have one charging while another one is uh, another one's being used. So, uh, of course, if you're doing doing land travel, then of course uh, you can change that limit and go into something like a Jackery or uh, uh, of course we've been using the Geniverse for the last couple of years uh, for that type of uh, charging. Power is always an important thing. Alex, what do you think? I, I use a couple different things. I, I use a lot of the Anchor um, ones. I like ones with some kind of LED that tells me what's left. <laughs> so it's just easy so I can look at it. Um, so one of the ones that I'm looking at upgrading to, I mean, I have so many anchors that it's kind of hard to, but the one that I'm looking at, at getting uh, as I kind of move forward is is one of these. This is the Mag Go. It's not very big, but it has, you know, it has a lot of uh, the basic things that I need there. The other one that I use probably the most is this small rig. So this is a the reason is, is that I standardize on things and I tend to be like, this works with my cameras. My camera system is a V-mount, but it also has a ton of power that will allow me to, it has a uh, USB-C, USB-A. It also has barrel connectors um, to it. So if you, um, if you look at it here, let's see, this is the, there's the V-mount, but here you can see the barrels that I have available to me as well as my, um, uh, as well as the D-tap and everything else. And so rather than having lots of different batteries, the one that I've been traveling with the most is a couple of those in the bottom of my bag. They are a little bit bigger and heavier. Um, they last forever, <laughs> but it just means that uh, I can plug it into almost anything that I may have uh, in my kit um, from D-tap to V-mount to, to USB-C to USB-A to barrels. Paul Wallace. Hey, I, I recently took an Amtrak trip from Hot Springs to Austin a couple, a couple days ago, and uh, I brought this, which is a... Uh, Bonai, it's called. It's got a solar panel on here. It has four standard USB ports. It has two of the old micro USB ports, and it has a USB-C port. And I figure, well, I'm going to need it. They're not going to have any power. And I get in my seat in the Sky Dome. AC power. They have AC outlets right there. So I didn't even need this. But it's a, it's a good thing. I just wonder... How much of this brick is taken up by the solar component if I really need this? Because I never really use the solar on the thing. And I anchor, I've got a bunch of anchors. You know, this has been so much uh, development. We didn't used to have this many options. And now between uh, equipment sipping power more, uh, all the new solid state stuff is it draws a lot less power. In my old studio, I remember I had 128 Edison type plugs because everything had to plug in. And now almost nothing in my rig really requires power. It can almost all run via battery. So it's gotten better. But that means, just like everybody has said on the panel, I have now probably nine or 10 different travel power banks. I have really small ones that I'll hand off to my wife, put in her purse, keep her phone charged. And I have 
reasonably large anchor banks that'll last all day and everything in between. So this is something we've all had to pay more attention to as time goes on. Uh, Andy, I hope you can find exactly the right one for you. There's a lot of options out there. Good luck with it. Let's go on to the next question. Well, it looks like Guy Cochran throwing a Cochran, but he's not here to pick it up uh, from Seattle. He says, will Logitech come out with a, a MFT Micro Four Thirds webcam? And he has a link there for us to look at. Interesting. Jeffrey Powers, start us off. I'm really excited because if this uh, this sounds like the next iteration of Mevo cameras. And if you had a Mevo camera, I had uh, their first Mevo camera. I got it right at the beginning uh, after interviewing them at CES. Uh, it was uh, it's, a, it's a camera that has a self-contained battery, that had uh, NDI ability to it, that had uh, multiple different ways to stream to it. So if all of that is going into a four-thirds, micro four-thirds lens kit camera, then I'm really excited as to how streaming is going to start happening because they uh, you could take uh, three different Mevo cameras and hook it up to the phone and uh, do a stream from there. If they're going to keep that idea, then this is just going to be a game changer for anybody that's doing phone streaming on the camera, although I, I'm guessing the price is going to be a little bit high for that. There were two companies that uh, announced Micro Four Thirds cameras. Uh, Logitech was one of them, and Yolo Live, the makers of Yolo Box, came out with their Alpha Cam at ISE 2024. Alex. Yeah, it's pretty exciting if it if it actually happens. Uh, here's the the rumored uh, images of it. Um, so it really looks a lot like a lot of the other little box cameras that we've looked at before. Um, what's really exciting is you have a USB in, USB out with the HDMI um, there, quarter mount, um, a quarter inch, uh, quarter 20 mount. Um, the Ambarella chip is a pretty popular one for this kind of thing. So it should have some relatively good performance. Um, so if it actually comes out, now there's other mic Micro Four Thirds that was actually mentioned down below here. This Yang Nuo <laughs> is a Micro Four Third for about $550. So, you know, my guess is this this will cost somewhere between $400 and $800 is probably the target that they're trying to make. They're probably not going to want to go over $800. they are probably not going to be able to go below $400. If they get below $400, they'll sell as many as they can make. Um, if they um, if they get to $800, they'll sell a solid number, and there's kind of a gradient between the two. Um, I really think this is exciting. I'm I'm looking forward, I admit, to uh, Super 35 and full-frame sensors, but Micro Four Thirds is a huge jump up for webcams. Paul Wallace. Yeah, I had uh, the original Mevo. It, it never caught on with me uh, because the the other cameras came along, the other Logitechs. But uh, yeah, if it's 400, I'm going for it. It looks like a great camera if it's got good mounting. And and, I, and if I was going to lay bets, I just want to make sure. We're, I don't think it'll be 400 I think it'll be about 600 to $700. But I think 400 to 800 is is probably the, the range that it'll fit inside of. But six or $700 is probably the, the most probable number just because of the cost of production. I'm, I've been so fascinated with Micro Four Thirds, but I don't have any Micro Four Thirds lenses. So this is a process for me of buying not only a new camera, but buying into a new lens system. And if I'm going to use it for more than a desk cam, if I wanted to do that, that would make sense because you just buy one lens and you're good to go. Uh, I think this is that. really a live camera. This is really designed to be a desk camera. Like this is a yeah. this is a Micro Four Thirds web camera. <laughs> like it's, there you, you know, that you could use. The nice thing, the HDMI means you can put it back into a switcher. You can do a lot of other things with it. So. Um, but I think that it really is designed as a, uh, it's not designed to take it, to do anything with it other than as a live box, which, you know, I think that because so many people are doing live, there's a lot of camera manufacturers that are starting to look pretty closely at this. S something that we've said has been missing for a long time, which is a larger, uh, larger sensor size um, uh, camera that that really works as a, as a webcam, like a lot of us are using, you know, much more expensive cameras right now. To do that. Yeah, be interesting. So they'll sell a lot of 1835 or 1850 lenses probably to give people that desk mm -hmm. view. Um, let's see. Oh, Courtney wanted to get in on this. Courtney? Yeah, I just wondered if it uh, could also be used as a, uh, in, uh, as a drone camera if it has built-in power uh, as a, a very fairly high-quality drone camera, except it doesn't have a means of recording. I don't think it does. I don't. And uh, the other possibility would be to use it as a in a gimbal, a gimbal mounted camera for a live camera. Yeah, that would make sense. Alex, did you see the weight on there? Is it? Yeah, I don't. Uh, 
yeah, I don't think it's a weight an issue of the weight. I don't think it, it has. Oh, it has a micro SD memory slot, so it could it could record. It doesn't look like it has the kind of controls that we would expect. If you look at the new, um, you know, for for a drone camera, so I think it'd be hard to control. If you look at the new camera from Sony, the LR1, that is really designed as a drone camera, and you'll see that it has kind of engineering fittings into it to allow it to be controlled more effectively. And I think that that I don't. I think this one's really aimed at. Again, at the web as a webcam or a multicam inside of a you know a, a live experience, but not probably anything more than that. A L- lot of innovation coming out. That's great. Let's go on to our next question. All right, coming in from Mariella Zusha uh, Miera from uh, Weblo, and she asked, "Is Reddit the world's most reliably human forum, a goldmine for investors, or just an old-fashioned dumpster fire?" I love that description. Reliably human. Alex, what do you think? Yes. <laughs> yes <there you> go. <laughs> all of those things. We have that's, a that's single the power word. Of Reddit. <laughs> that's the power of Reddit. It's all of those things all at the same time. Uh, so <laughs> it, it is both. A, it's a, it's reliably a human forum. It's a goldmine for investors. And it's an old fashioned dumpster fire. And I think that it's, <laughs> it's done a really good job of being all three of those things at the same time for the last decade. I concur totally. Jeffrey. <laughs> Well, I know that there's there's a few different people that are really making some good uh, good revenue off of Reddit, uh, building up communities and uh, and and making them, you know, within rules. The big problem is a lot of people go to Reddit and then they they start posting on Reddit. They get they get uh, banned or shadow banned, and then they they stop using Reddit. Uh, and then there's other people uh, that I know that uh, that just love to because it becomes it becomes an instant continuous feed of text and they just love to read so they'll just sit there and for hours on end reading all the replies which uh, it's crazy to me but uh i there i i would love to see somebody come on the show and talk about how they use reddit to really uh improve what they're doing with their productions because i know it can be done um but i just don't know how to do it paul wallace yeah, I think they just I think they just cut a deal with someone big. I think you all know who I'm talking about. And uh yeah, I I find it more and more the go-to place. I agree with Alex what he said. It is this crazy thing. I've been on there for probably 10 years now and uh the best of Reddit is stunning. I I always get drawn back in to ask historians because they have one of the most strictly curated set of professional people who talk about things from historical accuracy. And if you don't have serious historical chops, academic or otherwise, they will very firmly and very quietly quash you and say, you might not want to continue to contribute to this because this is for academics and other people. And the, and the information you get there is stunning. On the other hand, I have dipped my toes into things that are about as hot and bright a dumpster fire as can be possible. And that's the magic of Reddit. You have both sides and you have to really curate your own experience from it. And I find it really endlessly pretty fascinating. Let's go on to the next question. Next question comes in from David Brady in New York City. He says, are iOS control center applets locked to only what Apple provides or is there a dev market for them? Alex, what do you think? I don't think you can put them on that control screen. So I think that in the control center that Apple has, it's what Apple has there. But you can build widgets that show up. There's a uh, Apple has a breakdown of this of where these widgets, where your widgets can show up. Here you here you can see um, iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, Mac, and so here you can see what where small widgets, medium widgets, large widgets can show up. Um, I don't see anywhere where the the control uh, space is there. I think Apple wants to keep that relatively clean. Um, for the user, but there's a lot of places that you can put widgets. And I will admit that I thought that they were a waste of time and they were frustrating when they first came out. And now I use them all the time. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so I, I, I feel foolish. Um, you know, I was like, ah, these widgets, these big windows, I just want my apps up there. But now like half of my screen are widgets, um, you know, things that I want to keep track of, whether it's time or my schedule or, or pictures or weather or, you know, other things like that. I've got two iPads, one here and one here. And so the the issue that I have is that, you know, they're up there and unless I'm using them to run Mimo Live or to run um, Mix Effect Pro or a couple other things that I that I use them for, they just sit here, you know, and so uh, quietly waiting to do something. And so I, I've learned to put widgets on them uh, when I'm not using them to be useful. 
So, um, so anyway, so I would say that the widgets and the home screens are probably more valuable anyway. Um, but I think the control, the, the specific control window that I think you're talking about uh, is, I think, controlled by Apple. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to me, Apple's the control, but allowing users these kind of access things is really an interesting uh, bifurcation of their approach. It's like we want to give you as much control as possible and as little control as possible all at the same time. And I just find that a fascinating approach and it works for me. I know other people it won't work for, but it really works well for me. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from Scott Pulsifer in Philadelphia. He says, Zoom won't do 1080p unless you pay them $1,800 to $2,200 per year. What other consumer routes can we get to 1080p? Thanks. Uh, Alex, start us off. Not many. <laughs> so there's not many. Uh, th so there are some solutions. Uh, again, I, I think that uh, the – I believe that if you – sign up with some of the organ some of the um software that is allowing for direct integration like Mimo Live or Vmix. I believe that they're capable of of 1080p, but I'm not hundred percent sure. We haven't I've mostly been using them through Zoom ISO. So I haven't I haven't uh, checked to see uh, whether they do that or not. Um, the other thing is it depends on what your what kind of show. Are you trying to do point to points? Or are you trying to do discussions? Uh, if you're doing point to points, uh, you can get 1080p even 4K from things like Stream Voodoo. Um, there, uh, so Stream Voodoo will let you do a point to point and even have some discussions back and forth. Two people could send, for instance, a, a link to each other, a magic link to each other, and, and get 4K 20 megs a second back and forth if they have the bandwidth to support it. So it, it depends on if. You're, but if you're trying to do a discussion like what we're doing here. Uh, and you want to do it at 1080p, I think Zoom is one of the only solutions that's going to work um, work well. Jeffrey Powers. Yeah, because it's not about the resolution as much as it is about the uh, the ability to actually get it to work on everybody's computer and uh, have all the apps and have all the bells and whistles that you need to get a production going uh, like this, uh, like a a Office Hours production here. Uh, there are, if you want to go different route, <clears throat> Excuse me, if you want to go a different route and you have, uh, and it's only like uh, two to four people that you're looking for at a time, you can do a stream yard, you can do a restream. Both of them are, uh, are also branding themselves as uh, small conference app uh, programs. Uh, and uh, you get some, you get control over the web on that, but not to the control that we have right here with Zoom. So you can keep that in mind. And uh, and I, I, Robert did say WebEx does do 1080p, but once again, you're dealing with probably paying the same amount for that. Paul Wallace. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, and Guy Cochran knows something about this. But it, can't you add a portal to the mix and and get a res boost with that? That's 720. Okay. It's not 1080. Okay. And anybody okay. can get 720. So if you make a phone call, if you have a paid account, just a regular pro account, and you make a phone call to Zoom, not phone call, but you, you file a ticket with Zoom, you'll get 720. Like they're not going to give it to you unless you're asking because it's expensive. Like, you know, these are expensive things to do and they reduce the stability if you don't have a lot of bandwidth. So that's one of the reasons you don't, not everyone wants 1080p because if you have 1080p going into an office with a thousand people, it makes a big difference uh, as far as how many people can watch before it starts to break up. So, um, so the, so Zoom is only going to, if you, if you know the difference between 360 and 720 and you go and ask for it, you're going to get it. That used to be a, a much harder thing than it is now. Um, the, the hard part is getting to, to 1080 and the 1080 again is expensive to administer. It's not, you know, there, there's a lot of infrastructure. They can't just give it to everyone. So that's why it costs money to, to make it happen. Uh, Jeffrey Powers wanted to get back in on this. Jeffrey. Yeah, and if you have if you're if you're doing conferences, I was just at a at a event yesterday where they were using Zoom, of course, to get uh, into the little expo rooms, and these people were not they definitely weren't using 1080p, uh, but. Uh, the more important thing is that if you've got people that still are running, you know, by Best Buy cameras at 360p, it doesn't matter if you're running 1080p, it's still going to be a 360 uh, video that's coming through there. Yeah, it, that's one of the things these services tend to drop down to the least requirement that people need. And so, yeah, let's move to the next question. 
Next one comes in from Robert Sabobody in Poland, and he says there were over 300,000 people watching the launch of the third Starship test flight today on YouTube. Everyday Astronaut was transmitting in 4K, NSF, and 1080p at 60 frames per second. Uh, why did YouTube throttle everyone down to 360p in both the USA and Europe? Network limitations? Uh, Jeffrey Powers. I have not seen a 360 limitation, so my guess is that the node in your area was not transmitting as as well, or or your your connection uh, to the internet was not working as well. But I've been watching the whole thing on a couple different uh, couple different avenues, and both of them, uh, including this one, and of course uh, it is at 1080p. No, not a problem. Uh, Alex. Yeah, the, what happens is the players, um, oftentimes, if, there, if there's any kind of congestion within the, as Jeffrey was kind of pointing out, if there's any congestion in the internet, the player is designed to prioritize uh, frames. So it wants to give you real-time frames no matter what. And if for any reason there's some internet con con you know, congestion, uh, a lot of times those frames, if it starts to see them get held up for whatever reason, so there could have been some kind of internet storm, some kind of other thing, you know, that's that's out there that that causes some congestion, and the player is gonna is gonna react to that congestion by reducing the the um, the resolution. Now, oftentimes you can go in and manually try to push it back up again. So a lot of this is the players automatically jumping to something because they see it. And of course, if they st really see that that congestion, even if you set it at a higher resolution, they may come back. But that usually means there's some some kind of internet congestion. It could be something inside of YouTube. It could be something in the internet. But that's what's happening is the player's not seen enough bandwidth that it thinks it can reliably source the higher resolution um, because of whatever is coming to it. And, that, and again, that could be at your house. That could be at the internet. That could be in you know a variety of servers. And so it's gonna it's gonna scroll down to to make that happen. Three hundred thousand people watching a live event is nothing to YouTube. Like there's so many live streams going out and especially with YouTube TV, the infrastructure there is so large. It may see it's 300,000 is a lot for those of us who stream. I mean, if you have a stream with 300,000 people, you like to talk about it, but it's not a big number. Like there's, they're doing millions and millions and millions of viewers of streams, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of streams live all the time. <laughs> you know, so, so there's not, uh, it, you know, it's, it's definitely like 10, there's probably 10 or 20 million viewers at any given time watching something on the YouTube infrastructure. Um, and so, so I just think that it's, it, it's just, it's probably some kind of unique congestion that that's happening in at this moment or uh, around those events, but it, it, 300,000 is not stretching the infrastructure at all. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from a guy named Joey in San Diego. He says a client has a Blackmagic ATEM Mini with two input sources for video, and they're using it to feed a Zoom live stream. The quality of the video is not great. Is there any tricks to get the best video quality through the ATEM Mini? Courtney, start us off yourself. Well, I don't know if you'd call them tricks. It depends on whether you're using the um, AVC, the USB, the USB output as a webcam, or whether you're using the HDMI out uh, into an encoder of some sort uh, in your computer to send it uh, to Zoom. Uh, there is a known issue of crushed blacks if you're using the USB output. Uh, other than that, I find the video pretty good. The quality of the video in determines, of course, the quality of the video out. So if your cameras are not up delivering a sharp signal or a uh, stable signal, that could be a problem. And remember, it uses the uh, input number one as the key for sync and everything else. So put your most stable and your best looking image into number one, um, and that might help you out a bit. Alex? Yeah, the so yeah, I, I don't quite understand the you're using it to feed a Zoom live stream. So if you're sending it to Zoom, uh, this could also be an issue of WebRTC based on what you're playing out. So Zoom, you know, Zoom is doing a real time compression going in. It may not be the mixer at all. So what you want to do is look at the mixer, um, watch it in a quick open QuickTime or open something that's going to look at the video VLC that you can see the video in real time coming into it. Play it out. Is it really happening there as well? then then you may have an issue it's very rare for the a10 mini to have if it's got if you're using whether it's the uvc or the hdmi it should have really pretty high quality audio, um, video coming out of it um, but what could be happening is is that like for instance i use i do a lot of keynote over zoom i know that there are a handful of transitions sweep, sweeping across the screen doing a bunch of having a bunch of movement that's going to break up in zoom it's not the switcher it's just 
the, 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 the limitations of WebRTC. And so I'm going to lose frames. It's going to look staticky. So I, I change the way I do those transitions so that I can, so that I can keep them clean. So those are things to kind of keep in mind as well as you, as you go down that path. I, I think it's probably the zoom element of that, not the ATEM. Next question. Next question comes in from Bobby Rafferty in uh, Central Florida. He says, do you use colors or another way to categorize your clips in your video editing workflow? Alex, start us off. I'm big into color. <laughs> so I, I like visuals. So um, a lot of times I will color code things all the time to make sure that I just know where they are and what, they're, what they mean. Um, and, and that allows me to, at a glance, um, look, at, look over at something and get a sense of what I have there. So color is a big one for me. Yeah, and I use color, but I, I'm a Final Cut editor, which means that we have access to a system of keywords that are built into Final Cut. So my first level of organization is always the application of keywords, not just to clips, but to ranges within clips. And the way it works, you can filter by keywords and call up keywords. So I don't really need more than that to do most of the organization for even complex video projects. But in support of what Alex says, in, in a lot of the work that I do, color coding, if I have something like one of my audiobooks and I've got to track characters, I take a lot of time in in color coding even the characters that show up in my timeline because it is so nice visually to be able to see who's talking in a scene as you scroll, scroll through it and say, I need to get to the next place this character is talking. That's a brilliant use of color in a timeline to help you get more efficient in your edit workflow. So I'm a big proponent of color and anything else you can use to organize your work as you do it. Let's go to the next question. Next question comes in from Douglas Carmichael. He says, Microsoft is launching Copilot for Security, which is a niche-focused chatbot for IT security professionals. Your thoughts? Uh, let's start with Courtney. Courtney? Well, there, it's interesting that the model, the, the revenue model for this, it's $4 an hour they're charging for this. They're charging uh, per time period, which I don't believe anybody else is, is based any of their charging for GPT access on a per-hour basis. Uh, but they're doing this, I think it's kind of an experiment, and they're working off of a, a specific security-based model, consumption model, that uh, uh, they've harvested from all the security web, uh, cybersecurity websites out there and their own cybersecurity efforts. It's using GPT-4 as an engine, uh, but it'll be interesting to see if they stick with this $4 per hour uh, charge. I worry about it being exploited, you know, that kind of scares me. Yeah, it's an interesting figure. Uh, Paul Wallace. Yeah, I was kind of excited about it till Courtney said $4 an hour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it'd be nice to be able to say, hey, Defender, I've got, uh, you know, an attack coming in. What do I do? Or ask it IT questions. It'll be interesting to see how it handles IT type questions. Jeffrey Powers, what do you think? If it is using ChatGPT, then I really hope that there is an option that says if you're a ChatGPT uh, subscriber that you can put in a code here and and, uh, and not have to pay the $4 an hour. Uh, it is It becomes bloatware on Windows machines. Uh, I'll tell you that. Uh, I'd love to take it off uh, certain machines because I'm never going to use AI on those machines. They're meant for other things. And maybe there is a way. I just haven't really researched it just yet. But uh, it, it, and that's going to happen with a lot of AI is we're going to start to see an OS's built in AI systems that uh, that once again, like I said, needs to have the option to be able to tur be turned off. Next question. Uh, next one comes in from Paul Kovacs in Elkhart, Indiana. He says, having problems now with Final Cut Pro trying to add markers to the beats of music seems to skip or jam on the timeline and will not mark properly. Uh, tried everything, no other programs running, et cetera. Tried using Mac Studio M1 Max and M1 Ultra. Uh, Alex, you want to start us out here? Yeah, the first thing that I would look at is what compression codec you're using. So some codecs, you know, you should have enough drive speed to play it back. But I will say that if you're starting to do a lot of work with a certain certain codec, some, even Apple ProRes at times, you could end up causing it to freeze up, you know, not freeze up, but you'll hear the audio continue to go, but the video will stop moving. I think that's probably what you're, what you're having there. But um, anyway, uh, that's the, that, that, that would be the first thing I'd ask is what codec is the, is the file in. 
Yeah, that that's that resonates with me too. If you haven't transcoded into a mezzanine codec for doing your editing, and you have something that is really complicated, either um, a long op or something that it needs to calculate, that could slow you down. The other thing that I found a lot of a lot of my friends have been saying my final cut has really slowed down terribly. What's going on? And I said, did you upgrade your uh, OS recently? They said, well, yeah, I did. It does have to do a lot of indexing sometimes when you redo a um, system. And a lot of people were saying as soon as the last OS update came out that their machines were taking a couple of days to go through their big hard drives and re-index everything into the new system. And they were having all sorts of delays there. Once that got through and once they left their machine alone overnight a couple of times for, so that it could do all the behind the scenes work, suddenly things went back to the way they were before. That's just another possibility. It's really hard to try to settle these down over the course of time and figure out what somebody else's problem is. But try both of those things. Give your machine some time and also try Alex's suggestion and see if either of those help you. If not, the Final Cut forums out there can be really good. A lot of really useful, knowledgeable people who will help you out. And come back if you continue to have problems, or we'll work with you to try to fix it. Next question. David Brady in New York City uh, says, I have a few apps on uh, OS X that ask, app name, would you like to access data from other apps on Quit? In other words, Zoom OSC. Is there a setting somewhere in security or accessibility control panels to whitelist this? So he doesn't Alex? have to answer each time. I don't think there is. And I think that that's specifically because Apple wants you to have to approve it all the time. Apple is very security conscious and um, having something become part of the the background tapestry, so to speak, uh, probably isn't the behavior that Apple would want. But it could there could be a way in accessibility to do that. By the way, David, I, I did look for the ability to identify my headsets and I can't find that either. I don't know if the newest operating system got rid of that, um, but I, can't, I still can't get my my headset to work. Um, I have to manually get it every single time. And I think that, that again is an Apple security thing of not wanting you to accidentally turn on your mic, you know, and, and accidentally uh, have it a mic somewhere else, um, um, you know, possibly gathering uh, audio for a phone call that you don't want. By the way, we always remind you, this show is driven entirely by your questions. So if you have a question in the system or if you're in Mukon in the back end, you can vote those questions up and down. That gives you the chance to determine what we get to first and spend the most time with. Also, the QR code is very important. And so regardless of where you are in the world, if you pop into that QR code or use the link askofficehours.global, you will find a way to put your questions into the show kind of in real time and they'll go through a little filtering process in the back end and then immediately pop into the show so your questions are always the biggest part of this show so add them whenever you want 24 hours a day seven days a week that system of the qr code and ask office hours global is always on so if you have an idea in the middle of the night want to pop a question in for the next day it's free to use and simple so please take advantage of it let's go on to the next question our next question came in from a QR code entry. Andre Doyle in Berlin says, Alex, what's the name of the YouTube channel you mentioned for being a great chemistry and science explainer? Ooh, Alex. Sure. sure. There's this, 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 it's a relatively new channel. Uh, it's called Wacky Science. I think it's called Wacky Science here. I'll cut to show you a little bit of it. It's not that it is. I don't, I'm not going to play the audio right now, but it is a... Um, you know, it's it's got a little bit of fun to it. So it's uh, if you see, you know, you'll see this. Uh, um, you know the you, you know he they'll talk about the formulas and it, it, what what's interesting about it is it's relatively simple. It's not something that took a lot of, but you know, every time they say we're going to come back to that and they show the dog, so so it's got a little bit of uh, fun, um, you know, to it as well, um, and you know, kind of important. Uh, yeah, like this is this was a uh, let me see. I might actually just play this through the speaker here. The element symbol, but that has some problems. Look at these two molecules. They have the same molecular formula, but obviously they're not the same. They're isomers. Showing this difference is probably kind of important. It's the only thing that separates graphite from diamonds because they're both just fancy versions of carbon. And I don't think anyone's gonna go, mm, yes, this dusty black blob is indeed very expensive. One way to show the structure. Of <laughs> and so it's talking about how to do the structure here. Um, the uh, the I think this was the one I believe. Let's see here. Oh yeah, this is probably a good time to mention that compounds often behave completely differently than the elements they're made of. 
Like, you put together an explosive metal and a toxic gas, and you get, of course, an even more exp- table salt. You get table salt. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's fun. It, 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 so, he, so he has fun with it. Um, as well. And so it's, it, you know, and, but it gets into, you know, the conservation of energy, a lot of, I mean, I have to say, you know, as, as it keeps on going through, it's, it's 20 minutes or 19 minutes of, uh, of data that really gets into explaining how chemistry works. If I was, ha- if I had somebody who was having trouble, um, uh, if I had somebody who was having trouble with chemistry, I'd have them watch this about five or six times if I was, you know, um, to try to absorb as much as possible. Uh, the name of the, if I pull it up, it's, uh, this is, ge- this is called general chemistry by wacky science. And if we go to wacky science here, you can see that I'm subscribed, but they have all of physics explained in 14 minutes. How does Braille work? Um, the, uh, entire history of, um, depression. <laughs> okay. Uh, QR codes explained, which I'm, I'm dying to watch. I just haven't watched yet. Um, how does chat GPT work? And they have only been, uh, he's eight, an 18 year old nerd who makes silly videos on science and i have to say i think that's perfect <laughs> you know someone you know someone who understands the culture understands what they're um you know what they're doing i think is and but also is geeky and 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 is is going through that i think is a, is a really great one but in the last it's really been the last two months and uh, he's already at forty three thousand subscribers and to put it in perspective he was 10,000 subscribers less about a day ago. So, you know, you just, it, it really kind of underlines that, but I would highly recommend taking a look at it. It's a really, it's a really fun, uh, run, really fun video. And I, I think that I'm always looking for educational videos and, and how they're constructed and looking for examples of them and looking at this one, I was like, okay, well, I mean, I, I felt like I learned more. I saw, well, I, I didn't learn more, but I saw more that I had spent a year in, you know, uh, high school, chemistry covering what he covered in about seven minutes and i think that as educators we always want to look at those things because we're trying to uh trying to reduce the amount of time it takes some for someone to absorb some information it doesn't mean that this is going to be everything you ever needed to know about chemistry but having these big these quick overviews is a great way to get students off the ground and i think that we should as we start to move more and more towards understanding that we need to flip the classroom and have the, the students able to watch videos and then discuss it with their teachers during class, which is really the direction that most of this stuff should go. Um, uh, I think these kind of videos are great reference points. It's also a master class in why good writing and good performance of said writing is so critical. I mean, that could have been so dry and so boring. And I think we've all experienced well, that kind most of content of them are. being terrible. Most yeah, just them are. terrible. And yeah. why it's so rare and so valuable when somebody can really do that, make it engaging, conversational. Almost anybody can listen to that and really get educated by it because he's making it really fun to listen to. Well, and and with a good, to your point, with a good soundtrack, I mean, my graphic sense, I mean, again, it's done the way he wants to do it. It's done and it's also probably done to the limitation of his graphics ability. To me, it'd be really fun to put together a team and and put together like really high-end 3D, you know, and visuals and everything else for every, and just take the same soundtrack that he built and just overlay it with a lot of other things. Although I, I don't know if we might lose something in that process, but it would be it'd be really fun to, as an as a thought experiment. Yeah, as a matter of fact, since we're talking about the Academy Awards and all the rest of that in the second hour today, um, I was watching the um, the Academy Award uh, for the Best Supporting Actress, and I, I was so engaged with her in her presentation at the Oscars that I actually went and watched the movie and the movie was fabulous. And it's fabulous for exactly the same reason that was. The script seems so real and the performances seem so engaging and real that you get sucked into the story immediately, which is exactly what this gentleman did with his science experiment. It's like, even if you're not interested in the topic, when it's presented that well, you get drawn in and you want to know what happens next. And I just think that's, that's the the writer's art and the performer's art and why that's so important. My two cents worth it. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from Douglas Carmichael. He says, if SpaceX is not streaming natively on YouTube, how would everyday astronaut rebroadcast their extreme and smooth 4K without a native feed from SpaceX themselves? Courtney, you raised your hand. Start us off. Well, they may not have a native feed, but they could probably screen scrape from the SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX's website transmits uh, live video uh, that you can 
tying into on their website at spacex.com. So that may be what they're doing into a 4K uh, uh, capture card somewhere, and then they're rebroadcasting it over uh, their YouTube account, perhaps. Alex, thoughts? Yeah, we we do this a lot where we're, if you're a partner with the company, um, we will distribute those and we can distribute those and via, I mean, for broadcasters, we'll distribute it via LTN or the switch. Uh, or or even satellite uh, for internet folks, as Courtney was uh, talking to, uh, RTMP or SRT is a pretty popular one for those are delivery formats. And and sometimes we might have, I've had a, events where we have twenty or thirty different um, endpoints that we're sending out to. So we might be sending um, the raw feed to a, pit, a, a pool somewhere. Um, with four K, it's harder to transport over many of these more traditional ones. So you end up with some kind of IP solution. Um, and I think that right now, RTMP and SRT are the two most popular to distribute these, but you can definitely send a much higher bandwidth um, to something else and then allow them to then package that into their into their event and stream it out. Well, let's move on to the next question. All right, next one comes in from our own Paul Wallace here on the panel in Austin, Texas. He says, I went to South by Southwest Creative Industries Expo yesterday and made a Google album. How do I save it as a YouTube video with narration? Paul, you want to eliminate that a little farther? Yeah, I'm just going to, I don't have the answer. That's why I asked the question. But uh, basically, I I had a incredible time. I was there for a couple hours. I got to hold an Oscar, a real Oscar. And, uh, and then I got to hold another statue that's like a skinny Oscar, of a lady hold it. Courtney know what it is, but uh, it was incredible. I got to see the Army Command and all their little tanks and robots and uh, Kyle McLaughlin and some incredible uh, booths that you stepped into. And there was an actual replica of me in another booth next to me in 3D that you couldn't tell the difference between me and the virtual me next to me. It was incredible. There's just so many amazing things. So I'd like to be able to take all these pictures and videos and play them in like a, you know, a Ken, what's, what's a Ken Burns type thing where you t you narrate that and then produce that, you know, quickly. So maybe you guys can help me out and figure out what software I would use to do that. Anybody <laughs> Have any what ideas? did you capture it with, Paul? What kind of camera? What kind of are, just are you my saying phone. this is stuff? Just, just your phone. phone. So you shot it on yeah. the phone. Okay. Uh, so most 22, of the non-linear editors should do that. But let's go to Jeffrey and have his thoughts first. Well, uh, you can do part of it uh, in Google Photos. You just uh, choose the ellipsis, and I think it's called Highlight Reel. Um, you can you choose the photos, you choose the videos that you want, and then it creates a highlight reel for that. Uh, it can put some generic music behind it, but if you want to actually narrate to that at that point, you would then have to download that into some sort of editor, uh, put in your narrative, uh, whatever, and then... Uh, basically then upload it to uh, YouTube after that. YouTube used to have an editor that would do that, but they got rid of it like five, six years ago. So you're definitely going to need some sort of, you know, any, you know, like a DaVinci Resolve or anything like that to do something like that. Yeah, most non-linear editors, that's exactly the, t the process. And it doesn't have to be anything complicated. I mean, literally iMovie or, or uh, Windows Movie Maker or any of those, I don't even know if Windows Movie Maker is still around, but the basic ones will allow you to, take images, both stills and or video content, and kind of edit them so they get rid of any content you don't want out of them, string them onto a timeline, add sound. So if you can do your narration there, even add music on top of that if you want to do both. It's a pretty basic nonlinear editing task. And there are a lot of them out there. There's some even online that you can get access to. Courtney, do you have some thoughts about? What yeah, if you're on the Windows on the Windows platform, ClipChamp is the go-to uh, easy editor right now that's included in all versions of uh, uh, Office. And uh, and I think it's built in. You can access it or download it uh, for any Windows 11 machine. Or, of course, iMovie, if you're on the Mac. Uh, they have a, a means of, you know, generate generate a movie. You pick a uh, – you throw, the, throw all the stills into a folder – and uh, you throw in some music and you say, use this music, and it will create a, a slideshow for you with music. There you go. Paul, do you have another thought about it? I'm going to go with ClipChamp. I just like the way it sounds. 
<laughs> there you go. Sometimes the name is enough. Yeah, for a basic task like this, they'll all do just fine. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. He says, without getting into politics, will the current U.S. government action against TikTok bring more focus to privacy issues with apps and or bring more people to actually read and understand the end user license agreement? Courtney, what's your opinion? I don't think people will ever be able to understand the end user license agreement or read them because if you've ever taken a look at them where you have to click agree, you start scrolling down and sometimes they're 30 or 40 pages long of four point type and nobody's going to read that to, uh, uh, to go ahead and click on it. But of course, lawyers probably read it somewhere. Uh, but, but I think, uh, the, the thing everyone's worried about is data mining, uh, that you're giving up a lot of data to these services uh, like TikTok and Facebook and all the res- all the other social media networks. And they can mine that data each way from Sunday to get uh, to extract a lot of personal information about you and your habits and maybe where you live and your IP address and so on. And so they're a little bit worried about that. Uh, and especially if it's based in China, they're worried about uh, loss of privacy. Uh, I think the TikTok thing, I won't get into the politics of it, but I think it may be more of a uh, uh, a revenue move to try and uh, force them to sell to somebody in the United States. Who knows? Alex, your thoughts? I, I think that their concerns are valid. I don't think it's about privacy. So, and And I think that TikTok accidentally walked into the trap, which is that the real concern that they have is the ability to move millions of Americans uh, very quickly. So they, I think they said 170 million now have it downloaded. Um, that's, a, you know, it's getting, it's approaching half of the country and minor changes in the algorithm, um, inserting things that you want it, you want people to think about or that you want to expose. It's probably far more dangerous. The government, the United States government probably looks at that as far more dangerous than um, any any kind of privacy concerns, and so I think that their their concerns are valid in the sense that you know you look at <laughs> there's a there's a um, uh, right now the thing that that's starting to pick up speed. I like to watch trends on on TikTok to see what happens with them. But someone randomly started posting uh, videos of her kind of dancing to one very small clip of David Gray's Babylon, which has not been a hit for. 25 years, I think. And suddenly everybody's playing it, you know, like, and it's, and I, I heard it on the radio the other day, <laughs> like it's, it suddenly came out of nowhere. Um, and it's not, that wasn't organized or planned. Um, but what was organized and planned, but the point is, is that that kind of viral nature of something can be organized and pushed by the system. One of the things that TikTok made the mistake of doing was reaching out to their users and telling them to, to call their congressman and they overwhelmed Congress and it proved the exact thing that Congress was worried about. <laughs> like, like they actually did the thing that Congress was afraid that they would do. And that's why they want them to be uh, divested. It, it ha- I think it has very little to do with privacy and has very little to do with revenue. And has everything to do with being able to tell a Chinese com- a con- a company that is very uh, cloudy in its relationship with the Chinese government just because it exists and it's large and it's in China. Uh, it's... Um, its ability to express something and push everyone into action in the United States is definitely a concern that that um, that our 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 country has or our, our leaders have, and that's probably why it's there. And then they did the thing that they were afraid of, and so I think that that's that's what really got them in their mind. I actually don't think it's going to pass. I don't think it's going to get through the Senate, but I think that the the House um, uh, uh, pushing it, uh, I think, uh, kind of sent a message back that that they're not they're not excited about this. Jeffrey Powers. Yeah, as Alex said, it's it's not about the privacy, it's about the influence at this point. And that's that's the key thing right there. With a presidential election coming up, we don't want to have any uh, outside forces trying to uh, change anything like that. Yeah, there's a little bit of politics in here, but uh, unfortunately. But uh, the bigger thing is we've got to curtail and put out an understanding because it's more than just TikTok. I mean, we had, when TikTok came out, there was a bunch of competitors that tried to flood the market to, that were in the United States that fa- ended up failing. They had the same model as TikTok did. And uh, we could have we could have easily gone to a U.S.-based version of that, but TikTok was the, uh, was the powerhouse right there. But think about this. Uh, if you go on Amazon, you buy yourself a home security camera. Where is that home security camera coming from? Is it coming from the United States? Is it based in the United States? And, 
And if you start putting that inside your home, all of a sudden you have to think about, you know, reading the end user license agreement. So I think this is a great awareness from tick uh, about TikTok and a great case of saying, hey, you know, just don't buy something because it's cheap. Just don't do something because it's easy to use. Uh, be aware of where you are where your data is going because once again as we've said before the product is you in this situation and somebody's making a lot of money off of you alex the yeah i think i think that it would have been very hard for someone else to compete with tiktok because they didn't understand they didn't under fundamentally understand the value of tiktok and we still see this now is that you know, when you whether you're looking at shorts or other things there is you know tiktok's secret power is the reuse of other people's content and that is you know they they're trying to move past that but i don't i don't i think that they undermine their own ability to move forward when they, as they move past it it was the the kind of the core of musically of taking something and and you know having this shared experience that goes across it and so i think that that would be hard i do think that this also whether the the bill goes past or not it definitely puts bite dance and china on call of like hey we're not gonna you know like we're worried about this so before the election even if it doesn't go through it's it's you know firing a shot over the bow of like we're not you know we're not gonna let this go forward um and i, I think I, I did find it humorous that china was up in arms about it given how many things that they already censored <laughs> like it was like <laughs> this is censorship of da, 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 da. i was kind of like okay well you you don't get to talk about that <laughs> so, so anyway paul yeah, I think the whole point of the, without getting into politics, the whole point of it is somebody's going to buy TikTok. Who's going to buy it? Apple, Microsoft, I, I don't think, I, Facebook. Again, I think that the chances of it going through the Senate are very low. Like it's, you know, we'll we'll see if it does. Then then we'll be talking about whether we buy it. Or there's five months of of uh, wrangling. The chances of someone, uh, the chances of this actually leading to a sale is not zero, but it's probably less than ten percent that anything's going to happen. I want to make just one little point. Having worked most of my career in marketing and advertising, sometimes it's not the overt, it's the subtle. And I'm reminded of maybe 25 years ago, there was a commercial for McDonald's uh, starring Mean Joe Green, one of the big NFL players. And it really didn't mention McDonald's in the entire ad until the very tiny logo at the end. The point of that was not to talk about the product or anything else. The point of that was to generate an emotion and attach the brand to the emotion. And it was very effective at doing that. And that's what we're talking about with this world here. Attaching, manipulating an audience to attach emotions to topics. It can be very powerful. McDonald's did it and became a monster brand by using that as one of their recipes. Alex, do you want to have a last thought? I thought it was Coca-Cola with Joe Green. But anyway. The, was it um, like Coca-Cola? Maybe it was. I'm yeah. 25 and, and years so the, ago. I'm the, I, I'm from Pittsburgh, so we, we pay okay. a lot of attention to that ad. Um, so Atlanta's anyway, so the, probably uh, mad at me too. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, um, but uh, the um, the other one, I, I just watched this video with uh, Paul Giovanni, who, who, who said Giovanni that said, uh, you know, the the I will n I will not drink Merlot. Um, was they just thought it would be funnier to say it that way? It was they didn't know anything about. They didn't care about the wine. He's not a wine drinker. Like they didn't care. It was literally just rolled off his tongue as funnier than Cabernet or or something else. And so they chose it and it just wiped out the market. <laughs> like it just Merlot just gotten hammered from one independent film uh, that that a handful of people saw, but they were in the right vertical. And and so when you look at the ability to affect a market, you know, some kind of offshoot comment that wasn't even meant to be serious that for the writers was kind of a throwaway uh, line. Um, for it to impact an entire industry. Now imagine TikTok being able to do that at 170 million users. So that's the that's the kind of thing that that the government's concerned about probably more than than any any kind of privacy concerns. And that kind of branding is exactly what and this is not political. It's generic for everyone. That's what politics is descended into trying to attach emotions to the, their product, which is generally people. And so that I I see the concern for this. Let's move on to the next question. I'm an urge to order Chinese for lunch. Yes. <laughs> uh, next one comes in from Barks Meter in Columbia, South Carolina. He says, my eight-person video production company is using Zoho Projects to manage our shoot gear and crew bookings, as well as other as edit status, deliverables, et cetera. Simply put, it isn't tailored for video production. Is there other software recommendations for booking gear and or people? Alex, what do you think? 
I recommend General Show's chicken with American broccoli. That's that's my you know Hong Kong Hong Kong style. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, so anyway, that, that, that's the best. Uh, Spice anyway, level. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I go with medium myself. You, medium, you, know, you never okay. know with hot. Hot can be really <laughs> right. hot, so you always have to kind of stay stay back there a little bit. Uh, I don't have any good news for you. Yeah. The Zoho isn't really made for it, but most of us use the other thing that most of us use is Google Docs. So Google Docs in in production, there's a lot of tools that specialize in this area, um, and uh, eight person is is a pretty small. You know, we'll have a hundred people in something, and we're still managing it with sheets. So um, I will say that it's great to talk about other things, but I would say that 99%, like I was trying to think of like, when have I seen something other than Google Docs being used for this kind of thing? Uh, occasionally we see uh, smart sheets, um, uh, and, but we, I've not seen Zoho in one of these projects, but, but Google Sheets is, the, is really the core of, of many, many, many productions. And a lot of people are trying to break into that and no one has. Paul, you had a quick comment? Yeah, the, the trick with uh, Google Sheets is tabs. You have all these tabs across the bottom and the add-ons. It's incredible what you can do with it. Nice. Let's move to the next question. Next one comes in from uh, uh, Maidenhead in the UK. Sam Rames asked, what is the first step to joining the Office Hours community? How do I get started with McConnell and Discord? New to both. Great show as always. And this was a QR question. So he's coming in via QR, asking the big questions about how to get in. Alex, you invented this all. Tell us. <laughs> I don't know if I invented it. I, I, I started it. Uh, I, I would say that there's most of this has all been someone else's suggestion for most of the features that we have. Uh, the first step I would do is go to the website and sign up for, um, you know, sign up for the newsletter. The new, in the newsletter, you'll have links to Makana, Discord. Definitely sign up for Discord. Follow the instructions. You'll have to have a name uh, and a location for 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 Discord. Uh, and then you get into you can get yourself registered into into Makana, and now you can start asking questions from within the system. After that, uh, the next thing to do is the volunteer. And if you look at the volunteer um, opportunities, uh, there's actually a new volunteer meeting. Um, your timing is perfect. No, we didn't plant Sam. Sam really exists, but um, the, the new volunteer meeting is a Saturday. So. We'll send out a list. We'll send it out to the email, but the the, the new volunteer meeting is this Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we'll talk about what it takes to be a volunteer and what you might get out of that. Um, so those would be the next steps for you to, to take take advantage of. Paul? Yeah, the trick to uh, Mukana is you've got a notepad and you can take all kinds of notes in there and then you can uh, formulate your questions way in advance and you can uh, refine the questions and have a bunch of questions. All queued up, ready to go. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes in from uh, Vancouver, Canada. And James Haldane asked, do you prefer using tactical fiber with 2LC on a reel or not on a reel for 250-foot runs? Alex. Once I get to about 100 feet with, with tactical fiber, I tend to move to, um, uh, to reels. Uh, it just, it's just easier to maintain them. Uh, you know, you could go up to about 250 feet with, with uh, you know, just by over-undering them, you know, as you go through it. But I usually, uh, usually have a reel once we go over about 100 feet. Uh, it's just a lot simpler. And I admit that one of the things about it is, is that we rarely have a fiber reel that is less than 500 feet or 1,000 feet. You know, those are the most common ones because at under 200 feet, we're often still using BNC, so some kind of SDI signal. Um, but once we get up a higher than that, we start moving to fiber. And so it's like once you have that much fiber, you might as well have a lot of it. So we tend to have a, a thousand feet or 500 feet there, but we keep them on reels and it's a lot, a lot easier to manage them. Do you have a problem with the stability of your fiber reels? Do they do they last a long time? Because, you know, with fiber, one break and you have to go in there and do the repair on it. Yeah, I mean, so we tend – I tend to – my minimum – uh, order is tend to be a TAC 12. So I don't really get, I used to get TAC 4s and other things like that, but I really just get TAC 12s. And what that does is that, you know, you will lose them eventually. They'll get shut into a, into a, uh, a door. They'll get turned over. They'll, there's a bunch of things. Something will run over with a car. Um, it usually doesn't break all of them. <laughs> so, so a lot of times we have TAC 12s that have become TAC 8s, you know, or TAC 6s or 7s. Um, and so you, as you test those signals, you still have them running there. Um, we've ra rarely lost enough that it was really a problem. It's usually only one or two get snapped somewhere. Um, and we don't, we, we tend to just mark them, you know, mark off the, the IO mm -hmm. on the, on the ends to, and, and just keep moving forward. 
And it's pretty easy, I would imagine, to say these runs are still good. You can test that. Yeah, you just, we just tape quick. over the ones that aren't working. Um, and then at some point when you get, I mean, once you get to about three or four, you, t- you start looking at replacing the line and that becomes like some kind of internal test, uh, you know, reel. And then the other one's there. So you're not going to put up with losing too many of them and actually use it in production. Um, but, uh, and then of course, most of the time when I'm using them, I have two TAC 12s, um, so that I'm doing redundant, you know, redundant runs, uh, through a facility so that I, I, I know that if one gets, you know, we've had ones, uh, for like CES, we've lo- loaded into a booth, but we have to send those, fi- that fiber, we'll send thousands of feet of fiber to the booth, um, uh, you know, a month ahead of time or three weeks ahead of time, it gets put in there and, we do double run to every location in the booth. We did one with a really large booth, probably 100 by 100. Double run to like eight or nine locations. And we then, and then as they got cut up, we moved from there. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, we have an exciting day today. For those of you who are movie fans, we are going to be talking about the Academy Awards. Uh, it was fun to watch the show. I hadn't seen I, for some reason this one really engaged me in a way that uh, some of the others had not. And Alex would be breaking down some of the graphics and things like that. We always like to talk about the production elements of a big award show like this. Uh, I just had a couple of notes after watching it myself. One of which was really interesting, and I got a couple of quick little screen gabs here. Uh, it has to do with the graphics and how they presented things. They, I thought that they did a really good job this year of making it more human. One of the toughest things is you have a list of uh, six, seven, eight nominees. And in the past, they would just read the names. This year, they did something a little different, which is they had these gigantic um, visuals of the actresses. For example, this is the Best Supporting Actress category. And they pulled them up and revealed the actual actresses who had been nominated in the past. It was a way to connect performances from the past to performances in the more modern era. And you can see they did the traditional graphics approach with the circular things while, in this case, Jamie Lee Curtis was reading the, the award winners. Um, in this case, Devan, uh, Divine Joy Randolph won for the holdovers for Best Supporting Actress. So that they brought her up, let you see her. But the the real result of this for me is you got to see a lot more people. Instead of cold graphics, there were more humans. You could see Ms. Randolph um, accepting her award here, and behind her are all those former winners. And that process really made it much more personal for me than I had ever seen. I got to see more people. I got to see more costumes. I got to see the work of more. And that was one of the themes of this year's show. In fact, the other thing that I think was a huge win for them is after the results of the strikes, they brought a backstage crew presence onto there and said, these are the people that we were working for when we struck and tried to get better wages for that. I thought that was those two things that they did in the Academy Awards this year really did a good job of resetting the Academy Awards into something a little graphically different than it was before. Um, The biggest fail that I saw was um, in In Memoriam this year, and it was just for me the fact that it was really hard to see some of the titles and things like that. It was beautiful, well-designed, but I had trouble reading some of the things. Now, maybe on high definition, maybe that's something we want to talk about today. In the future, that may be interesting, but that was what I saw this year. And now I'm going to toss it off to Alex because Alex really did a a big breakdown of kind of his impressions of what the graphics in the Academy Awards were like this year. Alex? Yeah, let's take a look at this and we'll we'll, we'll kind of go through these really quickly. Um, But if you have comments or questions, go ahead and throw those in. And um, for the the panelists, if you want to just throw anything in that comes in, you don't have to raise your hand for this necessarily because I won't be able to see you because I'm looking down at this as we go through it. Um, This is where this is how it opened. Um, This is, I believe, uh, and I have to admit that. I haven't seen the whole thing of Barbie yet, <laughs> so it's not really my my style of movie. Um, I skipped through it a little bit as my as my wife and daughter were watching it, um, but it didn't didn't watch the whole thing. But I believe that they what they did is they painted out. This was already a shot where that was painted out, so I think this is actually from the original. Um, but I thought it was kind of fun. Um, this was kind of matching. You know, he he's on I believe green screen there. Um, to um, uh, let me see if I can get my mouse in the right place here. Um, the uh, so here, here you can see him, you know, I, I, I kind of enjoy, what's funny is that, you know, a lot of this, so, so I thought this was really done well as far as the integration goes and just really made it a lot of fun um, to, to have these shots together. And he's completely, now, the funny thing is, is that for, 
you know, where I think, I, I don't know where they got the idea, but a lot of times um, in the past, what we've done is junkets for movie companies where press people get to be in the movie. So what we what we do is we record them in the movie, um, you know, going through that process. And, uh, uh, we, but we take out the other side so that the, the press person can be talking to E.T. or Rango or other things like that. And so, I um, mean, they'd be part of the movie. And that's what this really felt like um, as far as that goes. Um, there, the uh, and again, uh, for the panelists, you can you can just say things because I'm not going to be able to see. Um, you know, if you want to add something to what we're talking about here, so this is the op This is how the open started here, um, and so you have a an LED. You know, I thought I thought the design was really good. I think that they're really figuring out how to. They're finally getting to a point, and I think it has to do with the technology moving forward. They're finally getting to a point where the LEDs aren't moraine, and you know, there's enough. There's a high enough density. But this is an LED up here. So on this wide shot, um, you have the LEDs that are there. Now you can see that they're using, you know, a lot of uh, this is this is a flying LED, and they have a lot of flying LEDs here. Um, and all of these curtains are all LEDs, you know. So this is all, you know, creating a little bit of the classic look. Another thing to look at that we'll try to stop at it a couple times is if you look down here, um, this is really designed as an uplight. So um, if we, uh, you know, right here, um, you're seeing basically, an, a, a, you know, they're, they're, these circles add an element to it, but it's also giving that kind of Oprah lighting as, as, as we look at it a lot. And here's where you can see the, the, the panels, you know, going up, um, being pulled up there. So those are all LED panels. And then you have more LED panels um, as, you, as you go through that. And you can see them kind of finish up there. And I, this will cut. Did you ever count bit. the number of LEDs? Because there's got to be like 21 so or 30 many. of them because there's, <laughs> there's five, so the five, one, the vertical ones that are hanging there, the big, the big curtain that was gone up. There's one. And behind all that, there's the yeah. orchestra that has three LEDs, three oh, giant. And just the layers of, of all of this up here that all these LEDs are, are going up into the ceiling to be dropped in. And a great lighting rig here. Um, here you can see these individual ones. This is what Bill was alluding to. These these are used throughout the show, um, which we'll show here in a, you know, in a little bit here. Um, but here you can see that uplighting being used. So you can see that the, that light, while a great uh, design element, is also providing some illumination there. It's not just a, you know, it's bright enough that you can see some of that fill, you know, coming in up, up here so that people can have their, you know, their, their uh, it kind of and fills in that, I that area. I couldn't figure out how they lit, you know, the stage elements, which were those swishy things that were not LED panels, the only things that weren't LED panels on the stage. Uh, they change colors. Uh, they, they have the gold theme. They have the, the black and white theme. They have the purple theme. And I, don't I don't know where they're, they're lighting LEDs. I, I don't uh, know. If they're no, not. those are those are those, are those big elements? swishy things on the either side. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are actual, you know, you can see they're three-dimensional right. uh, construction. And the other thing I wanted to mention, see that uh, screen on the right there, which is the iMag screen that he's on, right? If you noticed on one of the breaks, uh, they went away too early. There's a countdown clock. I thought you'd appreciate that for the oh, audience. Did they, did they, they, they put get, on the they, right they screen the countdown to, yeah, tell, they, to, to tell all, to, all the guests. That, that, how to, you're how soon to get back people. in their seats during the commercial break. Yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. You, you have a rest. Um, so, oh, uh, Let's see if we can get back to this close up here. I always like it when they do this matching lav. So, um, I, you know, I think that yeah, they wanted, wanted the lav to, in the center. I um, wanted to ask that because I've seen that more and more on news shows and the morning shows. The lav matches the costume color almost exactly. If they're wearing a red dress, it's a red yeah. lav. If it's a, yeah, that's that's know, become kind of a newer green thing. Dress. How do they do that? Do they paint them? Do they? Uh, well, they're they're they are made that they way. Make them I mean, in a hundred different. Oh colors? yeah, there's a there's a bunch of different colors. The the ones that really there was one called it's not the view. It's um the uh, the talk I think um and the talk uh, yeah they they color match all of them. Well, not only color match them, they make them look like jewelry. I mean they yeah, they no, really taken it to an entirely different green level. Green color. Yeah, but but. A lot of these are, I mean, I think that they painstakingly go through that, that, that process to, to get them there. But there's a, I think sure makes a bunch of different versions of those, um, you know, as it is, let me see if I can also, I want to make sure that I'm, uh, that we're, um, paying attention. If you're, if you're in the, if you're watching too, go ahead and throw those in. Bill, I don't know if you have that up or not, but we want to make sure. Which that, one are you looking for? No, just, just anybody's comments there. If they want to add anything to what we're talking about. Oh, okay. Here. Um, yeah. Uh, money is no object for the Oscars is what Marty said. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, Mickey says that, uh, 
um, uh, we've gotten labs powder coated. Oh, there you go to match the TV shows. So yeah, you can go. You can take that. You know, a long way um, in that in that process. But um, their wardrobe changes every day. You know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's Gail <laughs> King will be wearing a red dress one day no, they, and, and a blue dress, and, then and I'm sure that it's dress. planned. And I'm sure that there's the more you do it. The the more you do it, the more they're going to. Um, oops, let me I just hit. The more you do it, uh, the more they're going to have a collection of mics for you, and then it probably settles down to creating a new one every once in a while. Um, but let's let's go ahead and look through here. And I, I did cut some of this up, so it shouldn't we shouldn't have to watch. There we go. So here's what Bill was talking about here. So these now in this very first one, it just appears. The scary part is that, that later on. Like these things are coming down while people are walking out underneath them, and I was just like, I don't know if I would do that. Um, anyway, um, I just, just I, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of safety, but still, it's that's a that's a lot of weight, you know, coming up and down. So they use these as a way to highlight the the previous winners and come down, which I thought was a I thought was a really nice design, you know, in that you know in that process. So you can see these now. These are not again. This is not actual lighting. This is a they're lighting up that image, and that's all happening in the LED. Um, so there. So I thought it was interesting how they created something that kind of felt like it was there. There, you, there you have the see that they're walking out as they come up there. Um, but you can see, you can see the the weight of these <laughs> when you get this angle. I mean, these are huge. I mean, they're they're very you know they're they're uh, they're they're big pillars um, that are there. And then here you can see the the spotlights here. Um, so this is the these are actual spotlights which. Um, you know, had kind of more of the stage. The other thing that I thought that they did really well, and I think better than most Oscars, is the lighting of this this the lower crowd that they they spend a lot of time on. I thought looked better than most years, and, and I'm not saying it looked bad in other years, but um, uh, but it 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 just looked really, you know, warm. Uh, also, the the ring of lights on the bal coming from the balcony that are along the edges of each of the three balconies are all color coordinated with whatever color the stage is at that moment. So they yeah. change them from gold to purple to blue to accent. Yeah. And here you can see this. I mean, remember that this highlight is not, it's not a highlight. It's a, that's a graphic that's, that's spinning across there that, that makes that, you know, that makes that work. Um, here's the, the transition we talked about a little earlier where this will be either a person or the graphics here. And overall, I think these graphics work pretty well. These are nice little windows. And remember, these are live windows. So a live, you know, you have a live, basically this is a super source. So if you think about this, you know, and the way we think about it is these are holes that are cut out. So there's a, you know, there is just a, a square video under each one of these. And this is just matted over top of that um, as, a, as a way to do that and then created a transition. And remember that when you're watching a lot of this stuff, you have to remember that, that they, the coordination here is that this, that this person is, you know, could be centered, but it all, you know, so they, they either move them over or they shot them over to be in that frame. I mean, they could, if she if she's centered, they probably could just move her move her you know do a uh, a move to to move that graphic over. But um, but it, they have to think about you know how that frame goes, and it's very very well framed. Obviously, there was an immense amount of work um, designing designing that process there. And, then, and I always think it's funny when they have this. I, okay, so I guess that they, so they did have a they did have a mat there, so you can see the mat. This is the thing that kind of a I think when I saw it in real time, I didn't think I thought that they just did a square up mat up. But here you can see this this kind of glow. I will say some of the glows and some of the highlights felt a little photoshoppy, um, you know, as they as they worked through it. But I still think it was a, it was a really nice effect um, in that in that process. Um, here's it. So this is the part. I mean. Some of the, some of the elements that I wasn't as excited about was some of these elements here. You know, this doesn't. I mean, I'm uh, <laughs> like as a highlight. It just kind of felt like it felt forced. You know, like they were putting in. I was trying to highlight it, but it just didn't feel like it had substance. And then the other thing is, you have this traditional. So they made it look as nice as they could. I mean, but this gets into these little highlights that they they start using here that I'm not as excited about. And this is a straight like, hey, we have to have a frame that allows us to put up a 2D graphic. <laughs> like they're not, you know, like we don't know what that's going to be. It's probably sold at the last minute. And um, and we want to just, you know, so you'll see that pop up every once in a while. But when you see this kind of, when you see something kind of, you know, open up and this happens in a lot of, you know, and you know, here's a transition here. Hold on. Let's see if I, did I miss that.
let's see here. This is the um, just pulling back here. Do, 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 do. So here's the here's your transition here, which I thought was quite nice. So it's um, a sweeper, right? Yeah, the sweep. Yeah, yeah. So yeah you have the sweep the, here. The so so you have it there, and and you play it out. And what what happens is, is you, the key with a sweeper is to make sure that there's at least one frame that everything is obscured because that's where the cut is in your sweeper. So it's cutting from one source to another. And this graphic opens up, and you, see, and you see it. It, I mean, it is. They have it's covered right there, fully covered. And then the next one. So, I mean, that sweeper literally closes the whole frame for one frame. And that's where you set it up in the, in the switcher to make the transition. And then it opens up to the other um, to the other look, which was very similar. It looks like it just got all they used to do is get it in the graphics. Again, graphic up here that's making that work. Um, let's go ahead and move forward here. Also, they, and, they, they put a camera move in as the glint goes down on the graphic on the... On yeah. the overhead, on the proscenium, yeah. Yeah. We do have a couple of comments in yep. the chat. One of them, Ranjan, said uh, this theater was built from the ground up for the Oscars. Marty, uh, previous winners are great, and Laura Ziskin did it for the first time in 2000. I think she was the producer, wasn't she? And stage managers are watching the LEDs with an eagle eye for safety. And Robert Lincoln said, Revenge of the Glints. Yeah. <laughs> well, we <laughs> saw a lot of at real times. glints. Yeah, the, um, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of glints. Like here, so this is the this is the... I think this is the weakest part of the show right here. And then we'll go into some of the questions here and then we'll come back to it if we have more time. So this is okay as far as the open goes. But when we when we get down to this, I really felt like these felt really forced. You know, like they just feel like, I mean, 90s highlights. You know, they're not, I just didn't really feel like. And then this line across here, this highlighted line, just felt really, I felt like this didn't this didn't live up to the quality of, of everything else you know these lower thirds throughout the entire um thing just felt a little like this you can see there's little things as a graphics person that you can see like this kind of it just kind of drops off this this line here just kind of you know it doesn't have kind of a fade into this this here it doesn't it just doesn't it feels very kind of like composed and not it just doesn't feel physical um, you know i was going to ask you when they changed to, you know they had Three or four different looks. The gold look, which is the yeah. one we were on now. The red look, the purple look. Does the lower thirds change to match the look? I guess not, because we were in the red look there, and it was a gold lower third. I think it matches something that's in there. And uh, yeah, I, oh yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how they make that decision. Actually, um, the uh, one thing to notice again when you're watching for lower thirds is how they close the lower third. So you can see here that they'll there's a there's a grand kind, of, not a grand, but a but an animated open here. So it's going to open up. And it's going to build it out, but watch what happens at the end. It fades out. And the reason that you, the reason that you do that, is so that you can get out of it. <laughs> like so, you don't. What you don't want is an animation that's closing it out, and you're like, oh, we got to get rid of this because there's a cut or something like that. You can just you can just fade it out, or or you can you know cut away from it. So, but I felt like again, I I wasn't. That was I think the lower thirds are probably the weakest part of the of the show. Let's go ahead and jump into some of the the questions and comments, and then we'll come back to this if we've got a little more time. Courtney, you want to do these? Okay. First one, first question comes in from Rajan Chandil in Los Angeles. It says, what are they using to control all the LED panels on the stage? Big question. Uh, I'm we'll, going to guess we'll, it wasn't somebody's laptop. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, yeah, we'll um, uh, see if we can find out. It's, 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 you know, I don't know. There's a lot of controllers. Um, and, and, you know, there's a couple of different problems there, but there's, there'll be a lot of controllers that are there and those are going to be coordinated by a variety of software um, and so we'll, I'll, I'll ping around and see if we can't find out who actually did that, but I actually don't know what the answer is. Let's go to the next question. Okay. Next one comes in from Bobby Rafferty in central Florida. He says, any details about the technical or visual effects awards are presented and how they are awarded? Yeah. He um, was looking for actually, the win, when the technical and oh, this oh, excuse a few me. days oh, before some, the day before. I think that they, 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 they there, there was, was one a presented during awards. the show. There was, yeah, one presented during the show and then there was a. Um, a lot of them get, get done, I think earlier in the day, I believe. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's earlier. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. The VES society has their own award show. Now the visual effects society does have an award show, uh, every year. Uh, they did award the Academy award for best visual effects in a motion picture. And that was a Godzilla. Yeah. And I felt like the Godzilla one was an, int I think it was, I have to admit, I mean, I saw a Godzilla uh, plus one and I saw a lot of the other ones. I thought that. 
for the budget, I think Godzilla plus one did well, and I think it showed diversity, but it was not in the same class as most of the other um, movies. Like it wasn't like it was, again, you were amazed at, wow, they did this for not very much money, but you were not like, that's the best effects that I saw this year. So it, it, it definitely felt like a, a very political um, uh, choice because it was not, I mean, I think anybody that looked at it objectively would realize that it wasn't, it wasn't even in the same class as the other movies when it came to visual effects. Um, but I, but I, I can see why they did it. I just, it wasn't based on skill. You know, or, we have or, a comment you know, in there from Marty Peseta Jr. He said, I didn't do the Oscars main show this year, but the screens on that show normally have two full trucks controlling them, two full switches, and a couple of Pi systems. So it's wow. not somebody's laptop. No, no, definitely not somebody's <laughs> laptop. <laughs> um, and, and, and he said only about six to eight only working on the screens, um, you know, for, uh, for those. It's pretty. So pretty it's amazing. a big operation to do this. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, but yeah. Let's go to the next question. Next question comes in from Paul Wallace here on the panel in Austin, Texas. Any thoughts on the red carpet coverage? There was so many different red carpet coverages. And so I did record those. I didn't, I didn't get them. I didn't pull them up. Um, they, there was, I think there was an early one. There was a medium one. There was one by the, on the red carpet, which is a company I think that does these. Um, and so there was a bunch of different ones. I did watch a, a fair number of them. Own I know the, uh, the company that I work for does a lot of red carpets. <laughs> so, so as a result, I watched a lot of them. Uh, I felt like we wouldn't have time. Maybe we'll go back and I'll grab some stuff off of YouTube to look at. But, but, the, um, uh, but I think that one thing that's interesting to look at is the smaller ones. The, there's a half an hour red carpet that happens right before the show. Um, and it would cut in every once in a while to the other ones. And the one thing that I noticed, of course, is that the smaller ones all had wired head uh, microphones. And the, and the main one had wireless microphones. <laughs> and it was like, it was like, the, it was, it, and, I, and, I, and I was like, somebody said, you can't have wireless. Like, we're not going to coordinate wireless for all these little mics, you know, we, it, because it's so complicated. Like, it is such a complicated show to, to manage uh, wireless for that I think that that was, that was the case. But I did, I did notice that, um, you know, in general, it is a pretty, uh, there's always a little bit of a cringe moment because it's live. It's really live. And you don't get to see the thing to when you watch red carpets is to realize that you don't get to see live very often. And you get to see how rough it is when you uh, when you actually see broadcast attempt it um, because they don't do it very often either. And usually it's a little bit of a there's a lot of st starts and stops and and things that are happening um, in, in between. Paul, you got a comment? Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. My wife Dot and I, we watched the red carpet got so transfixed with it that we forgot the Oscars were on. We watched it an hour into the Oscars and then realized, hey, the Oscars are on. And then we switched. But it's interesting to watch how they move the people onto the red carpet with their dates and then they separate their dates out and then they isolate the the person they want to talk to. It's fascinating to watch. Yeah, it, 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 it really is interesting. They sh I felt like they showed more of that this year than they normally do. When For those of us who work on red carpets, you see that all the time. Like that's a standard operating procedure that the, you know, they have them come in together, then they'll, then the date kind of stands back. The, the main, the, the person who's there, unless they're a couple, I mean, unless they're both in the movie or whatever, that person will separate out so they can get the singles and everyone looks a certain way and turns their head and does the thing. And then the women turn around so that you can see, you know, and some of the men do too, but most of the women turn around and the men kind of, uh, just, you know, and then you have f folks, it, what's interesting to see is if they, if they have like a plastered look that they do. So like if you watch the red carpet, you saw The Rock. The Rock has a very specific like, you can tell that he's not that excited about it. Like he just goes and I'm going to stand up here. I'm going to do my thing. And then I'm going to walk to the next place and do my thing. And then I'm going to walk to the next thing. And he's, and he's very mechanical about it because you can tell he's just trying to get through it. So it just depends on how, and some people really get into it and they're really enjoying the, the adoration. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. My wife and I always watch it. We have a great time. She makes bunches of appetizers. And so for the three or four hours of the red carpet coverage on various networks and things like that, we just sit there and have a, a ball watching it. I will say that this is uh, this and the Met Gala. The Met Gala is really the, the pinnacle of out there fashion, trying to work the best creative minds of dressing people in the world. The Oscars is very close to that. And this year there was an awful lot of specific shoulder detail and things like that that I had not seen before. So you really are seeing trends emerge from the finest of designers in the world dressing extraordinary 
appearing people. I mean, let's face it, our actors and actresses um, are usually in the top 0.001% of, of handsome and beautiful people on the planet. And they are working with that canvas to show their designs. And I just think for people who are interested in tailoring, in costume design and all the rest of that, this is – the red carpet is their moment to shine. And you usually see some really extraordinary things that I just find fascinating. It's another creative industry that gets supported by this and I'm all for it. Go ahead, Courtney. Yes. Now here's the fashion segment on Office Hours. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, poor things affected the fashions this year on the red carpet – uh, and that there were a lot of puffy sleeves, and there were there were several women wearing such voluminous uh, costumes that they almost took out. You see, you see them in the audience, and they're overlapping the people that are sitting on either side of them. They're they've got such giant puffy I, sleeves and stuff. For some reason, the one that I was most impressed with is Emily Blunt's hair in in the red carpet. It's it looks like it's blown back. And and it and at first I was like, oh, they didn't do that very well. And then I looked at it closer. I was like, oh no, they did it perfectly. Like it, it just looks like it's blowing in the wind, but it's not. Like it's stuck that way, and it comes. Did you off notice of her, her straps? Her yeah, straps, straps on her dress were three dimensional. Yeah, they exactly. Sat up so, and off of her, it was yeah, really crazy. But it was really a fascinating thing that I thought that they did with her hairstyle. That that it, it took me a second when I was looking at the red carpet. I was like, what did they do? Her? Like her hair's a little messy. And then I was like, oh no, it's not. It's windblown, and it's windblown like with a lot of hairspray. I um, mean, it is like that's what it's supposed to look like. Oh uh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, you stole my thunder, Bill. I was going to mention oh, the okay. levitating <laughs> the straps. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> go, let's go to the next question. Yeah. Next next question comes in from uh, Rajan Shandil in Los Angeles. Says the U.S. Uh, the U.S. time change had the Oscars starting an hour earlier than expected, thus brought in more viewers. How does the start time affect the show's success? Good, Courtney. Well, I think you know because we had the time change the night before, and they moved it back to start at four uh, p.m. on the West Coast. Uh, instead of five, which puts it uh, into the 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Also, that uh, the show is usually three hours. That's the target time for it. And that usually puts them out before their uh, evening news break at the local stations on the East Coast. So um, that allowed them to not extend over into the news breaks on the East Coast. So that may maintain a audience for a longer period of time because they try and that's why they put the uh, best picture at the end of the show. Uh, to try and keep viewers there until the very end. But a lot of people on the East Coast go to sleep because it goes into the 11 o'clock hour, you know, usually. So this year uh, it ended at an earlier time. So I think it, it may have increased viewership at least uh, through the duration of the show because it doesn't go so late. Good ball. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we were completely thrown by the time change. We were an hour into the Oscars. We were still watching the red carpet, so... We we had to watch it on YouTube the next morning, the the right. first hour, and that's the I will say that's the advantage of having YouTube TV is that I I, I kind of scrolled through all of those things. I think I was like an hour, half an hour, hour behind on the Oscars, but I just I was working on something else and recording it for the show, <laughs> so so I was just managing that process there. Um, next question, Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida says Pixar got an award for the technical achievement of universal scene description. Uh, your thoughts on the significance of USD? It's huge. Like it is a, it is a USD is a, uh, um, it's universal scene description. Apple's version of it is USDZ, although I think Apple seems to be backing away from the USDZ and just going to USD uh, to make sure that it's maximally compatible. Um, but we'll see how that, you know, whether the USDZ is just a con con consumer version and the USD is how we use it. But what it allows you to do is move uh, animation as well as texture, lighting, all the bits and pieces from a scene from one place to another. Uh, Pixar worked on it for a long time because, of course, they had to move from a lot of different platforms. And uh, and they and they've you know it's something that's been made available to the entire industry, um, and so it is. Uh, I believe it's completely open source, you know, to to make that work. So uh, as a result, it's becoming the next. You know, we've had the lingua franca of 3D, and it keeps on getting better. So before, you know, there was you know um, there was one in between, and I just can't think of it right now. But you have uh, but you have the USDZ, and then you had we had FBX, we had OBJ. And each one of these contains more and more of the content that we need to move from one place to the other. And so I think that the um, so I think that this has been a huge uh, value. Uh, USDZ has made a huge difference, and and we're really excited about where it's going to go next. Next question. 
Next one comes in from Rajan Chandili again from Los Angeles. The presentation for the biggest award for best picture seems to be a big issue every year. How can they adjust the presenter's envelope or the teleprompter to correct this? Courtney? Well, you know, the the way they handle this, that used to be a big problem because the presenters used to have to announce each of the nominees. Um, and they've done that by pre-recording a pre uh, a uh, they pre-record the uh, all nominees in advance this year. So they just roll the video package. The presenters come up and they do their small talk. Then they say we're presenting the award for this, and then they go to the tape that goes through all of the presenters with the graphics and the actually pre-recorded announcements by the people who are presenting. They must have to come in early and pre-record uh, that uh, voiceover for that package of the nominees but i noticed on on best picture they didn't roll the package there are 10 now that we've gone to 10 nominees for best picture it can be quite lengthy and they'd be best to have them but they've been showing samples this year they showed samples of each best picture nominee during the uh uh entrance after each commercial break they'd show a pretty long clip from each of the nominees uh as it came back from each commercial. So maybe they felt they didn't have to show any clips or do any recalls of the nominees. But Al Pacino, this is the other problem, is every year they try and have somebody announce the best picture who is an icon in Hollywood, and usually they're quite old, uh, including Al Pacino. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to control them because they're so big, they're an icon. They may not be able to see the teleprompter. They may not know. They're not going to come in for rehearsals. Uh, because they're usually a big name uh, in the industry. So uh, when you get them there and you give them the, hand them the envelope, tell them to read the teleprompter, they may not necessarily do that. And they may skip reading all the nominees, which is, I think, what Al Pacino forgot to do then. He just went and read the winner as he came out for Best Picture and kind of ad-libbed his, uh, his speech. But it is a problem because usually the age and or reading ability of the person making that presentation on the best picture. And one thing that uh, Rajan uh, mentioned and said, in fairness to Al Pacino, his co-host was a no-show and the producers asked him to read the winner only. So some of that was uh, done because uh, there was somebody else that was supposed to be there. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, it seemed like it was, uh, you know, his his delivery of that, I see and then the, the net, you know, well, do you see anything else? And it, it just seemed a little bit weird. I mean, I understand I, all I think this, that, but I think you've got one if, line if, if it, yeah, and the if Oscar actually goes to. If someone not showing up, I think that the problem that he really had there was was putting him in a really, that's a really tough situation is that you don't have a lot of rehearsal and you just get pushed into the system. Next yeah. question. Uh, Paul, oh, sorry about that. Go ahead, Courtney. Paul Wallace has uh, asked the question, uh, what is Courtney's Oscar story? I have an Oscar story. Paul, did you have, did you, well, I don't know. You're, <laughs> I don't have an Oscar. That's an Emmy. Yeah, there's no, that's not an, an Emmy. Oscar it's not, not an yeah. Oscar. So I, th I, thought. I thought of the statue to the left of the Emmy was an Oscar. I, I apologize. Yeah. It kind of blends in with the curtain. Here. It looks, it's designed to look like an Oscar, but it's an, another <laughs> award that I won for uh, best assistant director back in uh, college. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and I think that Robert Soji's next next question is similar. Go, let's go to the, the next question and then we'll jump back into the video. Uh, Ken Gordon tells about winning the Emmy. Well, I, there, I did. There is an Emmy back there. The Emmy is, is a scientific and technical Emmy for uh, pioneering development in the field of electronic prompting. I got back in uh, 2010 for creating the first uh, computer-based uh, teleprompter. Uh, which is something I created back in 1982. And uh, I went to and the all of us ceremony. can thank Courtney for that. So that <laughs> yes, thank you yeah, every day. You Courtney. can blame me for the teleprompter. All right. That's good. That's all good. right. It was presented by fantastic. Jerry Lewis to me. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> was Dean right. Martin hanging around that? <laughs> no, he, he had left the planet at the time. Uh -oh. Uh, so here's let's go let's see if we can find a couple other things we want to talk about here. So this is this is the video here. Blah blah blah. Good movie. Such a way. great movie. I yeah. I watched that because so, of the Oscars. I went back and read. fabulous. So here's the you know you can hear see again. This is a. I don't know. I don't. Yeah. So they gave they gave them, that's and and by the way that looks small. It's an enormous screen. You know that, that that's a giant. It's a massive screen. You just the, the set is so big that you don't really notice how big 
you know how big that is as it as it goes through there. Um, the, I wonder uh, how many winches are mounted in the I ceiling know, of you know, that like the, stage. At first, I thought that this oh was a gosh. graphic, and I, I'm still not a hundred percent. Like, I don't know. It's no, that's a really... flying LED screen. Okay. At first, but I thought it was a graphic. Early, but I didn't see it early on because there was a uh, there was something hanging in front of it. And I thought there's a chain hoist that's hanging too low because we see it in front of that screen as it goes up. And then I realized they cut to that overhead shot, that looking. Right. The direct and that was a PTZ camera that was hanging down uh, right. directly overhead. Yeah, I. By the way, I, I know this is completely non separate from the graphics, but what I like his tux, the, the little texture there, it worked out really well for him. Um, anyway, so um, pleats are coming back. Do you have any of the musical performances of Billie Eilish where it shows yeah, the I orchestra? Do. I'll get that. Yeah, I'll get that, in a second. that. That was a completely different look. Again, a, a great. I thought that I. You know, again, this this. Uh, oh, let's see if we go back. So. I like how they, you know, they created kind of the Willy Wonka, um, you know, uh, tube system here um, to, you know, to to show. Let's see if, we, let's see if they show that actually. Yeah, I mean, I don't, they probably just for the crowd there. But I thought it was a really, I mean, they did. I thought they were very creative with how they use the graphics um, uh, behind behind them. So you have the everyone, you know, those those kind of graphics that feel, you know, they do feel in the, from the angles that they're shooting them in as a as a very uh, um, you know, 3D effect there, and you can see them fade out. It's more of a, you know, kind of a tube slash, I don't know, I feel like a tube, but there we go. So you can see them kind of appearing up here. So that, which I thought was a kind of a nice, a nice effect. Um, again, there's a lower third that we don't like. Um, and this is what Courtney was talking about here. Um, is they are lighting, the, you know, this is lit. You know here and what's interesting here is this is a much you know they created a much wider look here so this is so this i believe you know this is one big led so what looks like a screen is not a flown in screen it's simply a graphic that's on an led wall that's bigger which is why i still think that these might be coated with they may be 3d there but they may actually maybe be they'd be LEDs. backlit or something by leds yeah yeah um by, by think, little leds you know i thought this effect was quite nice so what they did here is to talk when they when they went to talking about uh, the script uh, or 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 to, to writing, you saw this um, you know kind of this, and then they started showing. Uh, let's see if they there. Was, I thought this was good, like showing actual pieces of the script kind of coming in as they talked. So you know, as they showed you examples of the show, they kind of showed this is what it actually looked like in that scene. You know, for those um, you know for these things, and so you. Uh, Anyway, I thought I thought that that was a really nice design element that they that they put in there um, to kind of make you you know, have you feel it. I did find that this th there were quite a few places in here where this felt really uncomfortable. <laughs> like there was a well at the end of the building, yeah, the narrow one, tunnel, the exit tunnel was it's a narrow tunnel, and it was a little like okay, why are we it was seeing too, them now? Too narrow. It, too. It was like a there, weird cutaway. There was one um, point where the rock he took up the whole tunnel, and he was had his back to the people walking yeah. by, and they kind of had to squeeze up against the wall to get yeah. by the rock how do you get by the rock i think that they're not going to do that again um the uh that looks like actual curtain which is amazing. yeah the reverse shot really that's is uh, yeah that's there. from the the back side off a of steady cam and you can see when when they cut to the reverse you can see them you can see them hide the uh steady cam with a light on it which is lighting them for this he ducks behind the piano just at the last cut and the, then the practical rotating stage to bring them around to face the audience. That was interesting too. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and by the way, their I, backs I, to the audience. That's their backs to the audience. Uh, there was a question about just, just doing a little housekeeping here. There's no reason to lock them to questions. So I'm not sure why we locked questions. So I'm unlocking that. Um, so I'm not sure why that happened, but feel, feel free to put more questions in. We'll just come back to it as we, as we go. So I was um, mentioned in the question, textures and graphics, and I had the same note for myself. The fabrics projected were really clean. I mean, it looked, even though those were all LED screens, the fabrics looked believable to me. Yeah, they were all three-dimensionally uh, rendered. Yeah. And we're trying to watch the chat, and you can still ask questions if you like. We'll just come back to them uh, uh, relatively soon. Um, so here you can see, and here you see that uplighting again that's coming from the from those edges. And as they you know come around, by the way, the performance I thought was just fantastic. But here you can really see that how that light's being used. See how much light is is coming up here um, in that process, which is 
Oftentimes a real challenge with stage lighting in general is getting up, getting that light. So there's the, now that looks very fast. I will, I will play it in real time. So it doesn't look like it was, it was like, uh, so, so here you see something that, that feels and that's very a really connected tight here. seam on those two, two yeah. walls going together. Really tight you. seam. So here you can see the, the orchestra um, being uh, brought up. And I think that they really got around like, Hey, we can do a lot of other things with the orchestra um, there. Uh, yeah, that's so the overhead here shot. you can see the shot there, but they they kind of learned that they could move the orchestra around. Let's see, and I think that they have a reverse. They have a reverse shot, so you can kind of see the orchestras. There, there you can see the the setup, and I thought that was a really nice design. And again, remember that this is all. And there's you know, a lot LED of this screen LED. behind the orchestra, and one in front of the orchestra, and one that flew away. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, again, a lot of us have moved away from, we've pushed away, pushed back on LED walls. And you can still see it. There is a nature of the way that this macro blocking is occurring that is driven by the LED wall. <laughs> like it is like in, in the compression. Um, it, so it's still not perfect, but it's definitely, we've definitely got past the marae. We haven't gotten past the, the um, you know, some of the effects that it has on streaming. And I'm, I'm sure that they're not worried about streaming because their primary viewing audience is still... This is the one where I felt like it felt like he was getting right. Yeah, see it. It just felt like there was a little of a weird setup, like they were doing something here, and and uh, and then he. It, so he was talking. They were waiting for David Allen Greer to get in there. Yeah, he's the voiceover yeah. guy. For right, the but show I don't think that they were really clear that they were on camera. Like it really felt like they were kind of just doing their thing, and he was announcing. I think someone told him, "Hey, you got to get back there. You're supposed to be standing over there, and you'll see him." As he's talking, he's gonna you know, so see you now. See how they shifted? Hold on. So there, you see that right there. This is them. Yeah, Keaton's looking. Getting for him, ready. Kind of looks over his shoulder. And goes, oh, where is it? Where is he? Yeah, where, where is the guy? Uh, yeah. it, see, <laughs> you see that? See her? See her face? Watch. This is her realizing she's on camera right there. <laughs> so, that's that's right. Sarah looks fabulous. Somebody's publicist is going to call somebody at the Oscars, going, "What the what?" You know, like, like you know, because they, they, this could have been a lot uglier uh, for whatever reason. But, but I don't think that I don't think they're conscious that they are lot. See, they're just having fun and they're getting ready. See Wouldn't how he's, he he's kind of doing a his adjustment. And he's kind of moving around and and he's looking around like what you know, what's going on there? Because they weren't mic'd. He was, the, the announcer was mic'd, and then, he, then suddenly she... Well, he's got a handheld Whoa. wireless. So well, that, they, they, the they, they came off the stage. They were presenters. So I, I think they're presenters they next. They were presenters next. They were on, on yeah, but, deck. Huh, interesting. They were on deck. I, so they were on deck waiting and somehow got put up much earlier than I think that they expected to. Um, anyway, those are some inside things when you're watching this stuff. Um, uh Let's see here. And Marty said that almost everything now is is presenting real scene. I mean, is most often representing real scenery under two and a half millimeters. Yeah. And most is, I bet you this is even finer than two and a half millimeters. There, so there they are presenting afterwards. And um, again, you know, nice. Uh, nice design on the stage. Yeah, this you is know, the silver as far look as, really nice. Yeah, so much different, you know, and and. That's the real power that everyone always talked about with LEDs. It's just that the LEDs looked so bad that we were always like, I know that that's what you want to do, but it's not working. And now it's working. Props Something. to all the art directors or the art director if there was one uh, yeah. person doing that job because it was beautiful. It really did a great job this year. Like, look at this. This is really nice. Hold on. You know, just a really nice, all again, something that feels, they aren't trying to make it look totally real. But they are trying to make it look, you know, it, it kind of gives enough of that sense, you know, as they as they work through it. Um, well, look at that. Hold on. This is a funny scene. But. <laughs> Funniest thing in the Oscars. Yeah. So anyway, so here you can see a really nice design here. Um, again, using the three of the five um, announcements there. And then John Cena comes out um, less clothed than everybody else. Um, sparse, I guess I would say sparsely clothed. Um, sparsely clothes. dressed <laughs> sparsely dressed sparsely dressed there um so uh and i think someone brought him a wrap during the during the viewing here um there we go that wall of costumes was a beautiful yeah, design was really too nice hold on that was back. lovely yeah. so this is yeah really well done you know so like the, a little dioramas of yeah. miniatures yeah you know, absolutely 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that worked out really well. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of new, let's see, there was something that was a little further up. Da, da, da. Did we talk about the prompters? We did not Ooh. talk about the prompters. Where were the prompters? Okay. Well, there was one permanent one in the middle, but I noticed during the monologue, you know, Jimmy Kimmel was not looking at the teleprompter, at which I thought was strange because I've, I'd seen a piece before the show, they were working with the writers for a week and they had, I don't know, 361 jokes. They were honing down to the few right. that were going to be there. So, you know, he couldn't be working from memory completely, but he was looking around and really playing the audience. And then there was a reverse shot that I saw. There were five teleprompters during that, uh, during the monologue and they must right. fold down and disappear for the rest of the stuff for the presenters. There's just one under the main camera centers, uh, center, uh, audience. Yeah. I liked. I will say that I liked last year's where the the it came up and then went down. You know, um, I I I like that look. I, I think that the it, they look. It better. makes the presenters very nervous. Though. They come out there and there's no prompter and they're <laughs> right. like, uh, uh, uh. Courtney, yeah, what was there, the there what was the technology? What was the technology in the court in the prompters this year? Did did you follow that? Uh, the same guys have been doing the Oscars uh, for about. I don't know, 15, 20 years. They do it every year, and I don't know if they do anything else, but uh, uh, it's uh, they have their own software. I don't know what technology, what software they're using, probably their own still. Uh, but uh, the the full, the rising monitors, once they went to LED monitors, uh, they can raise them up and cover them up, but you're going to block the view of a lot of people in the audience, which is one problem with it. So the ones that are on either sides only happen during the monologue and they put them on that second tier. So they're not blocking too many people. A couple of comments. Raj says the audience has led up lighting in the front rows. And then Marty is back in with, there were five large teleprompters across the room. Oh, that's right. The, I, I, I don't know if I have a picture of it, but we'll see. They put LEDs. That's how they, that's how they were. I, I remember Those thinking about that. They, LEDs on each back of each seat. Yeah. Every seat, like all the rows of seat all had backlighting. That's why everybody looks so well lit, you know? Um, so that was, I thought that, that was done. That was well done. Um, this is, uh, the drumming, which I thought was, was also, um, you know, quite nice as far as I thought that the angles and the, and the process and the feel of that was, was really well done. Um, that and the true. Barbie piece used a lot of that Busby Berkeley overhead pattern thing, which I thought was really a nice little callback yeah. to those early movies. Yeah, no, absolutely. There you go. This is really nice uh, a lighting effect. And of course, those are actual physical lights that got brought in, I believe, yeah, there to light them there. And so definitely added a lot to it as far as the experience goes. Well designed and, you know, obviously well integrated with everything else that's going on on stage. So I thought that, that was, that was well done. The drum circle was awesome. It was great. Yeah. Um, and here's a completely different look again. Um, and here you can see the, the winner is appearing. Um, each one of them there, and then it pulls up and to, uh, reveal them, which I thought, thought went, went well. Um, and then, uh, Let's see here if we go forward and you can see how they're all presented. Um, there's your, this is the, we, I think we had shown it before with all the circles, but here is a, another very creative way of, of grabbing this. So having an, you know, basically an alpha channel that's on one side or the other, that's cutting that person out so that this one, one's overlaid over top of the other one there. Um, and I thought, I thought that's something I'm going to take away. Like, oh, I haven't thought about being that creative with, uh, office hours from now on office hours is all going to be curved. We're just gonna have curved transitions between, <laughs> between us. So we're, we're, we're going to rebuild everything. Everyone in the back is like, Oh no. I will say one of the things I noticed about that is the reaction shots. They really went for reaction shots and all of those multiples, you saw the person who was nominated get their moment of somebody talking about their performance and you saw them react to someone talking about their performance. That human connection really sparkled a lot of the show for me as a viewer. Um, right. You know, we people don't normally get much praise doing their jobs. And I understand that, yes, this is Hollywood and Hollywood, they do praise everybody. But this year, you really got the secondary characters who did not win, truly had moments in the sun 
And they had done extraordinary work too. I mean, the people in the past, you got a list of people and then somebody wins you, you think that's the best person. And the other person got short shift, all the other four. This year, you really did get a little sense of the work that the other four had done. And I thought that was really charming. And they, and they brought the uh, gaffers and the lighting people and the audio oh, yeah, people the up on stage. And nice. that was the highlight for me of the Oscars, uh, celebrating the people behind the scenes. Here's another, uh, here's another one of the, the another musical performance. And um, I thought yeah, this was really well designed as well. So, you know, of, of how that was kind of incorporated into it. Um, again, I think that there's, they're definitely getting to the point where you can really start to the, oh, and what we get to see, this is, this is very unforgiving. So you can see that the, the line. There, that's the the line that yeah, opens the up join to show line the orchestra. between the orchestra. Yeah, we just didn't see it uh, under white. It's going to be really hard to hide. But that's that's your seam there. Um, there's that cheap uh, cheap graphic uh, look, um, and then here's your everyone playing. And again, I think that using a lot of this, you know, here. Here, there, you can the see seats. the five prompters right there. One, two, three, four, five. There you go. Oh, there they are. One, two, three, four. Right there. <laughs> Those are their prompters. So no matter where they look, um, if you're wondering where where they're all hidden, that's that's where they hide them. Um, so back of the room, really large. Yeah, that way they keep your. your well, it's your, midway. Your uh, it's the first uh, level of. Oh, the, is that midway downstairs? Trouble? Yeah. Midway okay. Back. Boy, that, so a um, seat behind one of those would not be a particularly good seat. <laughs> I'm trying to see what I what I thought was there was something else in here that I um, this is the in memoriam and then there was a um, yeah I had so much trouble reading those as we watched the show interesting uh, not in this setup because it's big here but when they had right. the really wide shot it was really tough interesting there were so I, many of them too they they had a big list at the end of like forty that they didn't even individualize and then they pointed you to a website where there were hundreds more right. The um uh, couple qu couple uh, questions. Let's, let's go jump to the questions that we have coming up here. All righty then, uh, Robert. Um, uh, sorry, excuse me, Rajan uh, Shandi in in Los Angeles says, "Could this show be presented for Apple Vision? The graphics and screens almost look virtual." Uh, you could. I mean, I don't know if you'd present it that way, but I bet you. I wouldn't be surprised if a year or two from now there's an Apple ver Vision version of this um, to, mm -hmm. to to move forward. I, I I would I would definitely expect that. You are yeah. there would be really pretty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, with and this you much put, beautiful design, you could put the Apple Vision right in the front and center, you know, down somewhere or or something to give people that view. So I think it. You know, it's just money at this point. <laughs> you know, and Apple's got it, so there's a high probability that we'd see it. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, they could put a Apple Vision. I don't know how they photograph for Apple Vision, but they could put somebody mobile walking around, you know. Yeah. And you could experience it. It'll be interesting to see through the the event. You know, one thing that we didn't talk about here which is because we're we're just looking at the graphics, but the fact that the streamers got uh snubbed for the most part out of this, um, you know, the, there's a there's this dance where I think a lot of Hollywood is sensitive about the streamers you know, there was just a big strike about it and everything else. And so the, you know, things may have gotten voted down, but they also have to keep engaging that the streamers, because of the streamers, they could just lose, they either create their own awards or just lose, lose interest in awards altogether. And that becomes more problematic. So you, you, you got to be kind of careful of how, how hard you push back on them because they are uh, probably the future of most of what Hollywood's producing. <laughs> like, you know, so, so pushing back too hard will be difficult. I don't think that we're, I don't think anybody really thinks theatrical in 10 years is going to be at the size that it is now. Um, uh, next question. Next one comes in from Stephen Montagna in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. He says, circling back to the in memoriam sequence, thoughts on having such a prominent performer, Andrea Bocelli, seem to upstage the artists being memorialized. Good, Bill. Yeah, uh, you know, having him and his daughter do uh, uh, his son. I'm sorry, his son do uh, Cante Patrio. Uh, it was it's a beautiful piece of music, and I think it's truly uh, set a beautiful stage for in memoriam. But I did have trouble with the way that presentation, full screen, they, the, the amount of time they stepped on it, and it was pulling me a, aside to watch him, to watch his son, to watch all the graphics. 
I really wasn't paying as much attention in that section of In Memoriam to who they were featuring who had passed away. And this really is the cap of of career for a lot of people. So I thought that was a little bit of a miss. I mean, he's he's an, an amazing I, performer. I I have to admit that th- th- there's been other time, other years where people say, "Oh, they didn't put enough, they didn't put enough production value into uh, the memoriam." Like that's been the complaint in the past, and so I'm sure the producers are like, "Okay, now what are we supposed to do? We did, we pulled out all the stops, we pushed it as hard as we possibly could. Now people are complaining that we pushed it too hard, and I'm sure they're just kind of like raising their hands, like, okay, you know." So, so anyway, so they're trying to. I think they were trying to bump it up a little bit, make it more important um, than it than it has been in the past. It's been a pretty simple uh, graphic in the past. And so I think that they're probably just going shrugging. I'm sure the producers are just kind of shrugging like, okay. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, and they used to be on, on a lot of the major uh, stars. They would do a clip with them actually delivering a line of dialogue or something that they were famous for from in mm-hmm. many of their famous movies. Uh, and it's hard to do that over somebody singing opera in the foreground, you know, so they had to forego that well, particular and piece. I- Cover the, I, think, be I think it's also it harder to get to as many people when you do that, when you do those clips. And so I think that, I think they're attempting to be more inclusive and in adding more people than what they did before, because I think that there was always some drama over, you showed 35 actors, but there were another, you know, 30 that were just as big as they were. And who's well, also we've who gotten and, to the point where every movie has 20 to 30 producers. And right. so you can imagine how many of them are dying every year. Uh, right. So, you know, to include them all is, is just problematic. Yeah. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Rajan Shandil in Los Angeles. They removed the backstage live stream this year. Any thoughts as to why? Um, probably because I didn't even know that the backstage live the backstage live stream even existed. <laughs> so they, I think, they had to I make it, room it, for all the LED screens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I, you know, my guess is is that it wasn't getting that much. I don't know even where that was. Like, I don't. Maybe someone can tell me. I don't know where the i mean i've done a lot of backstage live streams i just didn't know where that one was um uh to to watch so and or what it and what it had uh and usually those kinds of things i don't know enough about it because i didn't watch it the way live streams for backstage get killed is somebody does something that embarrasses somebody um once it literally is like you know the live stream is such a small part of the production that we've had live streams that we did for five years in a row that are like backstage and you see people walk in and out Somebody does something goofy that ends up on the live stream and the producer just goes, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Like, you know, like because it's not seen as a revenue generator and they, they'll they kill it in like 10 seconds if anything happened wrong. And that's why we're always under a lot of pressure to make sure everything works really, really well in the backstage because the producers are quick to get rid of it if they if they feel like it's, um, it's going to undermine the brand. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, you know, this idea of red carpets has blown up to such. I think there was two or three red carpet coverages. Well, this before isn't red the carpet, actual, though. This is a behind the no, scenes. No, no, no. My stream. point is that that as you move into that, you get confused as to what is backstage of where. All of those content pieces, we actually, just like Paul, almost missed the start of the show because we were so thinking we were watching the Oscars, but we were actually watching peripheral content. And so, uh, in the Oscar presentation, they had a lot of cameras back there, the the little tunnel cameras and the rest of that. So one show starts to look a little bit like the other. And it was a little confusing for us to know, when are we watching this show? Plus, I guess they had a five-minute delay or something like that. There was some protest going on. And so they didn't cut to the show right at the top of the hour. They had a little bit of a delay. So that made it harder to figure out. I was watching uh, Billie Eilish and Phineas, and, and, and Linda said, hey, it's it's, a, it's the time. The show should be on. Let's find the show. And we went looking at some of those other feeds to try to figure out how to find the show. That seems to be the problem with all this ancillary content. The uh, Mickey said that previously the backstage live stream was available on ABC.com. And, and Rajan said that it um, it was fun to watch because it was never recorded. It was just, it was just up there um, to see. And then people, and Rajan says, hoping to bring it back. Um, Marty uh, Bassetta um, said that uh, Oscars.com don't, I don't know the fact, don't know for a fact, but I think it's uh, due to small time for the red carpet o- uh, show, only 30 minutes. And Oscars.com used to be three hours before the show. And this is because, as as Bill said, there's just a lot of other red carpets that are going on. I think that the the on the red carpet, which I think is a company that does red carpets, um, I think they sponsored a big chunk of this um, or, or you know, they bought up a bunch of it so that there's like a big chunk that, that and which I, by the way, 
they needed to work harder on their graphics. You know, the, 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 not the main red carpet, but the earlier red carpets, definitely the graphics quality dropped off pretty quickly. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, the same thing. I didn't even know there was a stream. Was it the they're talking about the E Entertainment Network or bloggers? No, it sounds like what, Oscars put it on ABC dot com or Oscars dot com. It was something in the past that that I didn't, you know, I wasn't as conscious to. But that's part of the problem is you know where to go. Well, we were watching E, and it was a full blown show. They had two or three reporters uh, stages. Mm -hmm. They had a panel of three or four fashion experts. They were all commenting. So the the show before the show looked. I, I agree with you. It wasn't elevated to the point that the actual Oscars telecast was, but there was a lot of content that looked like regular TV that you could alternatively go to. So and it's and Robert Green corrected me and said on the red carpet is is ABC ABC Seven. So that's that that is their that's their show. Um, uh, Marty Pasetta. It's a, it's nice having people who are in the industry in LA. Absolutely, like, like sitting there working on some of these shows. Marty uh, Pasetta said uh, red carpet was only thirty minutes due to the Abbott Elementary uh, uh, Abbott Elementary premiere. So that's why things got compressed. Is they wanted to make sure that their new show, uh, you know, that it's such a huge opportunity after the Super Bowl or after. Uh, any of these big ones where you have so many viewers, it's, it's a great way to launch a new TV show is to put it right behind it. So, um, I love Marty's last comment. He is like a telethon. I did those. They never ended. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they keep going. <laughs> yeah, so Marty, yeah. uh, lo, uh, last, last comment here. All right. From uh, uh, Robert Shoji in Los Angeles. Says, what company and or person is responsible for the Oscars tech? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Well, if you look at the uh, <laughs> if you look at the uh, credits at the end, you can find out that there were lots of producers and supervising stage managers and art directors and uh, visual effects video screen uh, organization. There was actually a company given that got screen full screen credit for providing the video screens. I can't remember what it was. Maybe you can find it. I don't know in the in the credits, Alex, but we may not have. Had it. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was waiting to see if, if Marty or Rajan uh, threw, threw it in there. The um, uh, All I know is I can tell you, anybody who works on the Oscars, they have little jackets and they have little patches and everything else. And if you're in a corporate event and someone who worked on the Oscars shows up at your corporate event, they'll they'll remind you that they worked on the Oscars like every half hour. <laughs> so, so anyway, I guess you're, if you're a corporate person, you're just like, okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> so you you just kind of nicely, you smile nicely and just let them keep on reminding you that they this is what we did in the Oscars. So um, anyway, that was fun. It was fun, fun little uh, breakdown. Um, uh, I, Joaquin says aerial video systems did a lot of the camera builds, um, lots. Um, anyway, uh, that was fun. That was good. We, and we, we, we try to do these when, we, when these kinds of events go through and, and take a chance to see how far we can push YouTube before we get a strike. <laughs> which, we'll, which we'll find out later. Um, uh, so, but but thanks so much uh, to everyone who who came and had questions as well as comments. Thanks to the panelists. Can't do this without you. Um, it was great to have a great conversation about this. Um, thanks to the uh, to all, everyone viewing and asking the questions and being part of the conversation, both in the first hour and the second hour. I was a little worried. I was like, oh, I don't know if we're going to have enough questions to get to the second hour. And then we then we had them. Uh, the, the producers. Uh, came, you know, came up and uh, backed us up and threw a bunch of great questions in there and kept it going. So thank you so much for that. And thanks to the incredible team that manages what we're talking about every single day, uh, you know, manages all of our guests, uh, develops the content and develops the software and hardware that that, that is required to make this show happen, um, that actually cuts the show and edits it and makes sure that everything's there and manages the questions and, you know, actually even writes down what didn't work so we can make it better. So we really appreciate everybody's contribution there. We traveled uh, 59,000 miles today, 94,000 kilometers, and that is 465 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. It's a lot of bananas. That's I a, actually get the whole amount of bananas. bananas for we, yesterday. We've had more potassium, but it's a lot of potassium. It's enough to, it's <laughs> enough Hamish, to kill you. Uh, you know, like Hamilton, I'll tell you that. Directed the Oscar. But uh, I saw John Pritchett got a uh, credit for technical manager. Who, and he's a production sound mixer, so it's... Found it strange. He's moving up, moving up in life. They had so an actual Oscar at the producer. at the trade show yesterday. Yeah, but you didn't know whose it. it was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give an acceptance speech, so I could have. I could have had somebody job. film me giving an yeah. acceptance speech. Exactly. All right. I would have thanked the office hours. Most number, of, no, most number of microphones by a single panel member <laughs> goes to. <laughs> 
don't know how many cameras I'm competing, they got. I'm competing with Paul. I, I got a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. going to be uh, upstage next year. I want to thank yeah. Office Hours for all the, the accolades on my microphones. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> all right, see ya. Bye-bye.